I already did. Chair Kunzman? Yes, I'm here. We have a quorum. Would you like to call the meeting to order? Yes, welcome to the August 7th, 20. Someone's calling me. I'm wondering if it's Evan. No. All right. Never mind. Uh, I don't know if you can hear when my phone rings. But, anyways, welcome to the August 7th, 2023 um, meeting for the Cannabis Licensing and Advisory Board. Um, trying to pull up the agenda, but I'm assuming the first thing is uh, you're, it's up to you, Kristen, right? Yes, thank you, Chair Kunzman. We'll begin with our administrative agenda items this afternoon. The first one is instructions for virtual meeting and rules of decorum. Thank you. Public participation at the Cannabis Licensing Advisory Board meetings. The city has engaged with community members to create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, and boards and commission members, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. More about this vision and the project's community engagement process can be found at the web link posted here. Next slide, please. The following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support this vision. These will be upheld during this meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. Participants are required to sign up to speak using the name they are commonly known by, and individuals must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. Currently, only audio testimony is permitted online. Thank you. We will now move on to roll call. Member Anderson. Member Christie. Present. Sorry, I'm eating lunch. That's why my uh, video is off. Member Daniel. Present. Member Green. Present. Chair Kunzman. Present, and I'll, I'll send a text to uh, Member Anderson. Member Noble? Present. Ex officio Member Bailey? Present. Staff did receive notification that Vice Chair Keegan and ex officio Member Thompson would be absent for today's meeting. All right, uh, now for the meeting minutes from June 5th. Uh, has everyone got a chance to review those meeting minutes? And if, uh, is there any corrections or additions, anything that thought was not captured? And if not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. And since Brian's not here, you know, somebody else is just gonna have to step up, I'm sorry. I move to approve the uh, June meeting minutes. All right. I'll second it. Stacy's got second. And anyone? Oh, do we need? Uh, see, the other thing that I chair, people have to do hand things now, but we don't, we're not doing into hand movements yet, right? Anyone opposed or abstaining? OK, good. Uh, those minutes pass. Thank you. Uh, now, the next thing on the agenda is elections of chair and vice chair. We had put this off twice. Does that sound correct? That uh, is correct. Um, you had opted to wait until you had a full quorum. Yeah. Well, we didn't have quorum, I believe. I mean, I'm sorry, full complement of the board. Yeah. 
But I don't know if we're ever going to have a phone compliment. Uh, Brian did state his um, position or point of view, but I don't. But since he's not here, I'm not sure. What do you think, Kristen and or Andy? Yeah, I, I think Brian volunteered uh, to be co-chair again to the extent that the board nominates him. So he is on board with doing that if the other board members would like to proceed with the vote. Um, and then he, he also voiced a, a support to the extent that the board would like to uh, re-nominate um, Tom as chair. He vo voiced support for that as well. Now, as I've said before, well, uh, first of all, are we okay with going ahead? Uh, or do you want to try to put this off until another meeting when we may or may not have a full complement of our members? We do have quorum, right? Correct. Yeah. Thoughts? Go ahead, Ethan. I don't think anything's going to change. Um, doesn't seem like anyone else is uh, interested in those seats or positions. So I think it's safe to move move forward now rather than postponing. Thank you for that. Um, as I've said before, uh, you know, I'm not wedded to this seat right here. Uh, and uh, so anybody else who wants to step up, I, I, but I'm also quite willing to continue, continue serving as the chair and as Brian indicated via Andy, um, he's quite willing to stay on as vice chair. How about that's two cents from everyone, Robin? Thank you, Tom. I just want to thank you for having served in this role for so long and uh, express my appreciation if you're willing to do it again. I think you've done a good job. I think uh, Member Keegan does a good job as well when he's called upon. So I'm, I very much support those two things if the board wants to keep moving. Thank you. Thank you. Stacy. Feel exactly the same way Robin just said works for me to vote now. I mean, I think you guys have done a good job, and uh, no one else is saying they want to vote to have a chance at it. So uh, I, I'm hearing what it sounds like Brian thinks. So I think we're all set. And Michael, and then Allison, or either or, either or first. I agree with what folks have said. I nominate you, Tom. Okay. And you're okay with Brian being vice Absolutely. chair? Absolutely. Yep. I think you guys are doing a great job. All right. So then uh, technicality, Andy and or one of the Christians, what do we need to do? It sounds like there's a consensus. Have we heard from Ethan yet? Um, no. Yeah. Ethan spoke up first. And I... Uh, I guess I'll, I'll make it official that I have texted uh, Evan, but have heard nothing back yet. So we need to vote, I guess. I guess technically it's probably a good idea, right? Yeah, I think, I think you can get a motion for both nominations and a vote if it's consensus, which it sounds like it is, so. Right. It sounds like Michael made a uh, proposal, a uh, second on that. I'll second that, Chair. And then I'm not sure either Brian or I should be the one who does the vote, but can staff call the vote? Certainly. The motion is to continue with Chair Kunzman in the at role of Chair, Vice Chair, Mr. Keegan, for continuing cycle. Can I have any eyes? Yes. 
Are there any nays? Chair Kunzman, I'm not seeing any nays. Do you want a voice vote? I don't think we need to. I think everybody pretty much voted in their comments. Okay, the motion continues. Mr. Kunzman will continue to be the chair with Brian Keegan being continuing as the vice chair. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your votes of confidence. Uh, let's go on to general public comments for the board, from the, or for the board, excuse me. Agenda item number two, general public comments from the board. Public comment will be limited to three minutes per speaker. In order to um, indicate your intention to speak, you may raise your hand using the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen. I don't see that we have anyone calling in. Chair Kunzman, we see one, I see two. All right, and we will proceed with our first speaker, Lynn Siegel. Yeah, Lynn. I don't support any promotion. I do not support any promotion of cannabis of any type. I think the whole board should be disbanded. I think that um, in these days and ages, we don't need um, recreational drugs anymore, including alcohol, um, that we have people starving all over the world. We have climate change. We have viruses. We have inflation, um, wildfires, and plenty more important things to spend money on than recreational fun drugs. I think it's revolting that so much money goes into this and so much energy when we have war in Ukraine, we've got plenty more to be spending on than, than something like drugs these days. I did plenty of LSD and marijuana when I was young, but I'm 70 and it's gotten to be a whole different thing. And I don't support even when I did drugs because the, these were problems back then too. And I shouldn't have ever been in a position where I could have done drugs. So that's why I think promoting it in any way is, is completely negative to society, to our culture, and to the betterment of mankind and the common good. And probably my son is probably going to get a divorce because of it, because he smokes pot. And, it, or, and his grand, my grandson, and it destroys families. It, it, it takes people away from important problems that need to be dealt, de, dealt with. And it's really sad that it's so prominent in our culture. And I think boards like this and any other means of promoting it with tax breaks or, you know, I know it's in a downtime now, but I think it should, there should be active engagement to get rid of drugs entirely in our society um, and yesterday um, life's too short in a hundred years there's not going to be drugs anymore so let's start now and change this and make it a productive society um, it just uh, also with fentanyl and other drugs being incorporated into the street drugs or re regular recreational drugs and that kind of destruction and leading into opioids potentially um there's there's just no need to have fun by getting numbed what is the function of that yeah, by more, illusionarily more, five more getting, seconds then i've got four seconds okay by the illusion of getting Hi, too bad that we have a society like that. So let's get rid of it. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Kristen, did you say that there's two speakers? Yes. Our next spe speaker is Raju Bhatt. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for uh, doing this important work. I can understand what the previous speaker 
has spoken about. She's 70. Um, and so I can understand where she's coming from. Uh, I appreciate so much the opportunity to have cannabis in the state. It has helped me so much. I have autism. I'm on the spectrum. Uh, I'm able to have conversations. I'm able to interact and have meaningful connections. Or I'm able to understand myself better. The endo endocannabinoid system is so important. It affects our our mood, it affects our appetite, our sleep. Uh, the previous speaker spoke about waste of money. Well, there's a lot of waste of money in things that don't work, and this works. <laughs> this works for sleep. This works for appetite. This works for depression. And there's so many other uses too. We're just learning a few of the endocannabinoids. Uh, there are hundreds of uses for this. And we'll be finding out more and more. And so I commend you for for being present, for doing the work you're doing, for having an open mind, and for seeing how this wonderful herb can help more people. Um, I am concerned about pharmaceuticals, like the previous lady spoke about, and drugs and fentanyl and all those things. We should be very concerned about all those things. They do affect our youth. Uh, and I do think that it's important to have education, uh, education to our youth of, uh, and education to our adult population uh, of usage, timing, setting, all those things are important. The autism communities, they're educating themselves more about how it's helping and, and usage. We've got Dr. Cohen here in, in um, Boulder and other doctors who are amazingly doing amazing work and helping a lot of people. There's a lot of compassion and empathy in this process. Uh, I am grateful for the work that you guys are doing, but I do want to emphasize, yes, what the, I do understand what the lady is saying previously. We do have to have more education. I am starting a, a business as a social equity very soon, but I'm also going to have a nonprofit on the side for educating youngsters and for how to use this medication uh, more even as a meditation, how to use it as a meditation. So I appreciate your guys' work and I'm uh, looking forward to what you all have to say and share. Thank you for your comments, both of you. Um, I did not ask at the end of the first one, did anyone have any questions for either one of the speakers? seeing no hands up uh, and having a fairly full agenda, I think I will move on. Uh, would th there's any more speakers, Kristen? No, Chair Kinsman, there are not. Okay, all right, then. Um, so this is gonna be customary. We're gonna have members or uh, matters from the Cannabis Enforcement Officer. Um, yes. Right. Agenda item number three, Wait, matters. Hold on, hold on, Allison has her hand up. Oh, apologies. Sorry, I, I apologize to interrupt. I just wanted to let folks know I need to hop off at 3.30, um, but then I will join back when I can. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. okay, go ahead. Continuing on in our agenda, today is agenda item number three, matters from the Cannabis Enforcement Officer. Good evening, board. Thank you for having me on the regular agenda. Um, this meeting, I just need to point out that we've had a very drastic increase in the number of seized fake IDs from a lot of the dispensaries that before uh, I would not get any from. So we're not sure what's caused this increase. Um, I'm working with the state med to see um, what's causing this trend and I'll keep you guys posted. And this is on page 16 of the packet, right? Does that sound right, Officer Virginia? Um, I don't know. <laughs> seven, well, seven fake ID violations. So, yeah, but it's it's gone uh, up since then. Um, uh, okay. Just in the the week since, it's okay. it's exploded, and we're not sure why. 
is there a real time um, way for us as a as a board to check what you're reporting on? Um, it, there's not one currently set up for that. What I do is um, I make I send my numbers into Kristen and the licensing team to include in the packet. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not real time. You're going to be behind by like one or two weeks. Yeah. Okay. Anyone have any questions? I have an obvious question, but I thought I'd let somebody else. <laughs> Why? I do not know. Um, it's it was just an interesting phenomenon. It, it had no, no correlation with the students being here. Um, it had no correlation to, uh, and it's not really high schoolers that are doing it. It's people that are within a year of being of the legal age to buy it legally. Um, so um, it's kind of stumping us in the law enforcement world why this is happening. Hmm. Robin? Yeah, I just wanted to let the board know that I'm going to include in the next meeting packet uh, a, a report that had to be filed in the legislature from MED about their, um, it was a performance audit that was required through legislation. Um, and that's kind of interesting. And I understand MED is, is, is acting on all the recommendations in this report. So I think that bodes well for uh youth enforcement and with respect to the numbers coming up i in terms of fake ids i don't know i know that um 1317 and i mean house bill 1317 from 2021 is in effect and the ability of young people to buy large quantities of uh, marijuana from dispensaries and then resell to friends has really been curtailed, we understand, from that legislation because it makes it so much more difficult for people between the ages of 18 and 21 to get a medical card. And so I think that that is um, a really promising thing, but that may be why you're seeing more fake IDs, I don't know. I appreciate the information, Officer Ginyan. You're welcome. Stacy. Yes, thanks for that information. I couldn't agree more with Robin. I think that was exactly the idea that popped into my head as I was listening that if we're cutting down how much each person can buy and you're seeing this in that age group, chances are it is an effort to just accumulate more volume. I mean, that's like what I would guess. I, I can't really think of another reason why you'd be seeing more fake IDs at this point other than trying to not have been there that day or send someone out, you know, to just get more products. So that would be my uh, hypothesis. So I agree with Robin on that. Sounds about right with everything else that's gone on and changed. Anyone else? Pam, did you you um it's made it's made the news so you know i think we've all seen it but you know denver cracked down on um, some functions that were related to cannabis do you see any i don't know any association with any of that do, I mean, do you have any comments about what's well there, there was that one uh, stoner cinema event last friday but it was we couldn't find out where it was and if it was held it sure was very quiet and there was no police response to the area um they're going to be holding more of those events and so um i'm hooked up now with the denver pd's liaison um there's this little task force because colorado springs i guess had some issues a couple weeks ago during their event. So um, we're all banding together to, to try and get more, um, try and stop it because they're operating without a license on the state level. So hopefully by all of us collaborating, we can try and get 
get that to to go away. So the licenses are not um, given out by municipalities as a state license. Right. It, the company that's putting it on Stoner Cinema, um, by them selling these tickets online, they're basically operating as a business, and they're they're not licensed. So uh, the state. AG's office is looking into trying to go after them that way. Hmm. I wish we had, it'd be kind of nice to have a one or several young person's perspectives or. Yeah. Or but we don't have anyone representing them today, unless somebody else on, on this board has some insight from a child they have or whatever. Anyways, all right, next on the, uh, anything else? For no, sir, no. Okay, uh, are, there, are there any policy suggestion forms that came in late? Agenda item number four, policy suggestion forms received for the August meeting. There were no forms received for this meeting time. But we did have, I forgot to find it here. We did, we kind of, Go ahead. We had the one from that that we've seen previously, right? Correct. That is our continuing agenda item number five discussion regarding June meetings policy suggestion form, striking the requirements for medical and dual license stores to maintain a private consultation room. A copy of the form was provided in the packet. And Andy, did you want to? Uh... That's yeah. Start that off. Yeah, this is on PDF page 19 uh, of your packet board. This is a form that was submitted on uh, for the June 5th meeting. Um, in essence, what it is, is this is the, do we really need that separate cons consultation room for medical marijuana dispensaries? Should that continue to be a requirement that is imposed on um, on medical marijuana dispensaries as part of their having a licensed premises. And I guess the uh, Rewa Ward in our office has been with the city for a long time. And she did a, uh, what I would say is a pretty deep dive into some of the history surrounding where this came from and sort of how we got to this point. And I don't want to, um, get too much into the weeds of it but kind of what we discovered was that it was basically a zoning requirement so um part of the zoning i'm going to pull up the actual language here um part of the determination under the land use code under the brc as to where medical marijuana dispensaries could be hinged on this definition of personal service use which at the time we believe this was back in 09 and 2010 changed um, the medical marijuana wellness centers and included in the personal service uses definition, this definition for all kinds of alternative healthcare providers, including physical therapy, massage, acupuncture, nutritionist. Um, and it kind of bundled in with this, this wellness center concept. And then that got plugged into the BRC for the medical marijuana in that 6-14-7. Um, I think the, the key takeaways are, unless the, the board would like to discuss and provide, I guess, further input, I guess, one, I think Rewa and I would like to circle back with licensing staff to discuss this a little bit further. Um, but two, if the board were to make any recommendations surrounding this, we would need to get planning involved and make sure we're on the same page with understanding sort of the original principles of this. And, um, you know, I, I see Rewa's hopping on, like, uh, she might have some thoughts, so I'll kick it over to you in just a second, Rewa. But, um, the original principles of this and the whole concept of a wellness center and, you know, why it came about and what might change. So Rewa, do you wanna chime in? Well, the only thing I'd like to add to that is, you know, um, 
the fact that they were considered to be wellness centers required the premises to have certain portions that were licensed and unlicensed. So a patient could be escorted from a waiting area where, where um, non-patients can also reside or stay and be, and only a patient may be escorted to portions of the licensed facility. So there's a, a waiting room until that patient is seen, just like you are at a doctor's office, um, where the patient can be seen, as well as anybody with that patient can wait because that patient cannot go into the, or is not supposed to go into the licensed premises with the patient. So um, again, like Yeti said, I would, since we were not the ones that wrote the code, um, you know, looking back, researching what was said, what was presented to council in 2008, 2009, 2010, watch the code change through the years. I think wrapping in licensing, wrapping in planning, we could have um, a lot more, uh, a much more of a comprehensive answer for the board, um, at least by next month. In other words, you'd like, you'd like to discuss it again, Robin? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Rewa. I really appreciate that because I, I just want to say that it, as you look into this, um, one of the things that I felt really concerned about when I read the, um, the constituents' uh, suggestion form was this idea that maybe we are having bud tenders give out medical advice that they shouldn't be given. And I hope Stacy's still on because I'd really love to hear what she has to say about this. Um, and is this the only mechanism that we have for preventing that from happening? Because if that's if that's what's happening, um, I appreciate the suggestion to change this room idea to kind of make that stop, but that needs to stop. That, that just shouldn't be happening. And I just wondered if in the context of this conversation, you know, there's, there's some other things, maybe Ethan can, uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Ethan, but if you have any thoughts about that, I'd love to hear them. I appreciate that. Um, and I wholeheartedly agree with, with the conversation um, thus far that, you know, I, I, you know, personally don't deal too much on the, on the dispensary side of um, the businesses, but I do agree that, you know, this seems like the legislative intent, um, you know, is outdated um, in the context that we're considering today. And, you know, we need to do everything that we can to make sure that um, medical advice is, is not being um, provided to, you know, patients by individuals that aren't licensed to do so, or do not have the, the medical background that is necessary to provide that kind of advice. Chair, may I follow up? Yeah. I just, you know, I think when there's, you know, when we're using a uh, wellness center and patients, and I could see where the confusion can happen at the bud tender level. And I think that the person who brought this forward is saying this room is confusing to bud tenders as well. And I think there could be some real value to the community to having more clarity on all those questions. Stacy, did you want to weigh in on the issue? Maybe. I think she had to step away, Chair, for just mm -hmm. a few minutes. So the issue is when, when you have a what is it called? A dual licensed store? How many dual licensed stores do we have in in Boulder? City of Boulder. I can look that up for you and get back to you in just a few minutes. I mean, in the range of. I, I don't want to misquote it. So if you just give me five minutes, I can get the actual number for you. Okay. And, and until now, then there really there isn't a provider or a, like a licensed provider. I, I think Bud Tenders. Do bud tenders have a license? Does anybody know that, Andy, perchance? Or Pam even might know that. 
I, I don't, are the individuals, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I mean, like I have a license from the state of Colorado to practice medicine. Does a, a bud tender have a license from the state of Colorado to practice bud tending? I, I don't believe they have a license. I believe they're all registered with the med. Um, like I believe once the premises is licensed that they're registered, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Mm -hmm. They just have a standard badge that's provided to them by the state. There's nothing else additionally that they have to go through for training um, to be a bartender. Okay. It is a rather strange uh, situation. Stacy, have you been able to file any of this? Oh, you're still mute. We can't hear you. I missed the last about three minutes because I had to run. So I can't answer a question at the minute, but I'm sure I'll catch back up shortly here. Kristen, any luck on the number? I kind of, I, for some reason, I remember 18, but I don't even know why I remember that. It's not, it's not quite that high, but I'll, I'll get that for you in just a minute, Tom. I'm working on it. My question to uh, Kristen was to how many um, dual licensed cannabis stores do we have? How many people, how many stores does this affect? Because somebody who's just retail doesn't have to have this room, right? Does everybody see things the same way? It's only if somebody who has a medical license. I guess one thing that you and or I might be concerned about is, you know, in a, in a medical office, you have to you have to pay attention to privacy issues, and uh, doesn't sound like that was folded into any of this at some point at one point in time. But um, Stacy, just to catch up. Andy spoke first, uh, followed by Rewa, and they're going to put together some more information on the whole genesis of this situation. So there hasn't been a motion yet, but one thing to do is to readdress this at the next meeting. Did I capture that? Okay, Rewa and or Andy. Yeah, I, I think we need to get with the planning department to see how this ties into zoning better. And then also, um, we haven't had a chance to discuss with actual licensing staff sort of the implications of this. So that's, I think that should be the next steps. I have a curiosity question that I don't even know who would answer this, but are medical, are people getting out of the medical license or medical? um cannabis business is there a movement away from it they're getting out of the medical grows how about um selling it though so far the ones that have dual licenses have kept both of them okay so this is has not restricted or they don't feel restricted by this rule no they just they, they make more money on the rec side than they do on the medical side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any, any news, Kristen? It's not essential. We can, we're going to come back to this again. So We have five co-located um, wellness centers and dispensaries in the city of Boulder. And are there any just sole medical licensed businesses at this point? There are. We have both... Um, Sold medical licenses, sold recreational licenses, and then five co-located businesses. Do you have in whatever is in front of you, do you have the number of sold medical licensed businesses? Just a moment, I can get that for you. <laughs> Sorry. We'll, no worries. We'll, we'll come back to this next next meeting, it sounds like. Do we okay. need to I I'd like to add just to just to let everybody know, as far as the co-located centers go. Your predecessors map the marijuana advisory panel. Um, they weighed in on the BRC language with regard to co-located centers. And their idea behind 
the that there's a private consultation room for those. Again, you, you've got a co-located center, so you've medical. Their privacy is needed. There's a waiting room needed, um, and it was initially made to uphold the intent of the waiting area necessary for identification verification and for patients in the medical wellness centers. That's that's the history I could find with regard to the language in the what was it, which which I can yeah that that would be for the the in the recreational code for the co-located um, center. Okay. Uh, do we need a motion to table this until next month or next meeting? Somebody from the city. I, I don't think you need a, a motion. I mean, you don't need to act upon these policy forms. So um, we just want to make sure we're taking our time to figure out everything before you all are in a position to even make a recommendation to the council. So. Okay. How about we move on to the next item on the agenda? Because as I said, we've got plenty to do today. Um, so I have, uh, Kristen, unless you want to introduce it, uh, I have. Yes. Nathan Dewey, but you go ahead. Thank you for continuity agenda item number six, the presentation of the Responsible Association of Retailers, Nathan Dewey presenting. And this is uh, from pages 28-ish, I think, to page 50 in the packet. Yes, they begin on page 23. 23, sorry. I was down to 50 here. Okay, Nathan, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you, you all hear me? Yep, we can see you too. All right, cool. <laughs> Uh, I am watching my two boys. Um, hopefully they won't bust in, but if they do, I apologize. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, I see some familiar faces here. Uh, some of you have talked to or met in the past due to my history with my work. Um, I just wanted to lay out a few things. I know I already sent ahead a short little packet of information about what RAR is and who, well, not exactly who I am, but what we do more or less. Um, so I just kind of want to paraphrase that for you all real quick and then try and leave some time open for some questions and, and such. Um, I do want to say real quick, though, the topic you were just talking about is what I do. Um, if if you need those kind of things, that kind of information, that's that's something I can help you with, um, as well as why did everybody get those fake IDs? Let's figure that out. That's very interesting to me because uh, we don't get a lot of those up here at the dispensaries in Northern Colorado, just because a lot of people know they, they're not getting through. Um, so there's not a lot of attempts. So that's just something, so you can all know that we already have a, a little bit of a wealth of knowledge on. Um, but let me just begin by introducing myself again. My name is Nathan Dewey. Um, I am the director of a nonprofit program uh, geared around youth prevention and wellness. And that includes alcohol, marijuana, and all other forms of intoxicants and inebriants. Um, we run programs, I, I, don't, I do not do this myself, but we do run programs within middle schools and high schools uh, teaching um, about wellness and prevention. I'm sure some of you have taken a program that I was privy to growing up in Colorado called D.A.R.E. Uh, D.A.R.E. really just educated us about drugs, what they were, and kind of just said, hey, don't do this, don't do that. Uh, here's your here's your brain. It's a frying pan, and here's an egg. There's your brain. Um, not really effective, to be quite honest. We take a program called BrainWise and put it into the children's schools. Um, it teaches us about the left and right brain. We call it wizard and lizard brain. Um, and that is not something I'm really, really educated on more than uh, I can point those people in the right direction to hopefully one day get into the schools in, in Boulder and Boulder County as, as we will be moving there in the future years. Um, I run the program because it was started in 2004. Uh, unfortunately, a gal overconsumed alcohol up in Fort Collins and the community came together with an old nonprofit I used to work with called Team Fort Collins. And they came together to create a code of ethics, which you will see on that first page I gave you. Um, we have a code of ethics that generally says we diligently check IDs, we encourage designated drivers, we train employees how to identify inebriated individuals. 
um, et cetera, et cetera. It's about being a good citizen, a good community member, and to look looking out for the community at large, not only the children, but our patrons as well in these establishments. Um, and those are the code of ethics that we have them follow. And if they do go against those code of ethics, there are repercussions, nothing too severe, but more just what can we work on? Why did this, this thing happen? Uh, long story short though, at the beginning, RER was just alcohol focused. And of course, right around 2012, um, those years is when uh, legalization started coming around. Uh, the old nonprofit I used to work for, Team Fort Collins, was actually a major force in shutting down the industry in Fort Collins and a few other places. And um, it was even like mentioned in documentaries for National Geographic and such. So you can imagine me being hired in 2015, going into dispensaries and getting cussed out, um, being told to leave and they want nothing to do with me. Uh, as I was hired in 2015 to um, take over this program and introduce a cannabis, res cannabis responsibility, just as we've been doing with alcohol. Uh, just a little more background. So, you know, when I did join, we had 30 members. Um, Pre-COVID, I've got our numbers up to about 300 statewide. We are located in Fort Collins, Greeley, and Boulder. Those are our main hubs. But I do work in Windsor, Loveland, um, Fort, Col Fort, Col uh, Fort Collins, obviously, um, Longmont, and Lafayette right now. Uh, so we do have our hands stretched out there as far as the alcohol goes. Cannabis has been mostly focused in Fort Collins because uh, and Greeley, sorry, because jurisdictions like Longmont, Windsor, these places do not allow um, for cannabis sales. Um, so back in 2019, I was invited to take over what was the RHG, the Responsible Hospitality Group of Boulder. Um, there, the, the gentleman um, who was running it at the time, uh, it just became too much for him. And they found out about what we were, the good work we were doing in Northern Colorado and we were invited to take over that re responsible hospitality group. And now that, that gentleman is actually a member of the BLA now. Um, so it's really come full circle with, with him and myself and the good work we're doing with alcohol. Um, before I get into the cannabis, just a little quick synopsis of what we're doing with alcohol. Um, I do monthly trainings called TIPS trainings. If you're not familiar, they're alcohol service trainings. Um, the Boulder Liquor Licensing Authority, actually, the BLA actually requires that anybody who has a license or is getting a license is to um, have their staff trained within 60 days of hire. Um, and I'm going to tell you right now, uh, Boulder is one of the most responsible communities I have out of all my chapters. And I do believe the initiation of this uh, was something that was helpful. And it is something like I will be suggesting here in a second when I talk about my own program. Um, but it is a responsible safe, uh, safety service sales um, uh, training that you have to pass with a 70% or better. And if you pass, you can serve alcohol for three years. Um, beyond that, we do fake ID trainings where I bring in like uh, Officer Denig, who's the alcohol officer for compliance officer. It's um, Officer Pam's uh, uh, counterpart for alcohol. He and I do two trainings a year in Boulder where we have huge turnouts and people come and learn how to properly fake ID from law enforcement and myself. We do patron safety trainings where we teach about how to keep your patrons safe, how to not sell to people who are inebriated. And then uh, we offer things like black lights and you get a fake, you get a, sorry, you get an uh, ID, uh, brand new ID guide every single year from us as part of membership. Um, we have trainings every month. We have member uh, member meetings where members of the alcohol chapter come every other month to every three months. It just depends. It's a little bit different after COVID. Um, and we talk about industry specific things. The reason why I talk about alcohol so much is because this is exactly what I'll be doing with cannabis. Um, so in Fort Collins, I do the same thing with the cannabis dispensaries in Greeley and Fort Collins. People like Smokey's 420 and um, and and um green solutions and folks like these up up in the in the northern part of the state we hold meetings every other month to talk about industry specific things like for example why are we getting all these fake ids now that's a great topic i'm going to be bringing up to my folks here in fort collins um we talk about 
um, things like, you know, you're, you're, you had some great examples today, like the cinema, the getting the stony cinema or whatever it was called. Like that's, that's an issue for a community. And that's why we're here. We want to talk about that and keep the kids safe and the community safe as possible and as responsible as possible. So uh, why is that happening and what action can we take or do we take action? Um, on top of that, I have personally written and am state approved. Uh, I have my own program that's a responsibility program called Tenderwise. Um, it's on a short hiatus right now, just as I've had to rewrite it and it's getting re-approved, re but it is something that is going to be held monthly again. So I have monthly trainings for Tenderwise and you are not required yet to send your employees to these trainings in Colorado. Um, when I started out, I think I was one of like five or six people who actually did it. Now there's several more that are available for training. So it wouldn't just be me, but if you can prove to the, uh, to the med that you have all of your staff mem members trained, they will designate you as a responsible vendor. And that is something that, um, that can, you know, really help them in their case with the state, should they get in trouble. And that is something I would like to bring to the local level where you all might require or suggest that they, the dispensary or the whatever industry group member um, has all of their staff trained in tenderwise or any other responsible vendor training. And if they can so prove that, that might just give them a little bit of um, leeway with you, you know, uh, mitigating benefactor, as we say, right? So as long as they've not done anything too negligent, um, you're going to take that into consideration that they had all of their traps uh, trained within that 10, I'm sorry, 60 day period. Um, it's actually something I'm moving forward with in the other communities on the alcohol and cannabis side, that 60 day mandate. I've requested Greeley to do it and Fort Collins to do it, as I think it's a really highly effective thing. Um, also, I would say Fort Collins has a really good standing with their dispensaries and um, what. Um, what if any um, ramifications that have come through with with employees doing the wrong thing? Uh, they're they're really they really trained very well. They make sure that their staff is trained and has my responsibility training or somebody else's. Again, I don't just promote mine. Um, as we are a nonprofit, we just want people trained and and knowledgeable. So I didn't really give you a lot of that that um, manual just because it is un, being it is being reworked, but it is something that I hold monthly. And I am holding, moving forward from now, holding monthly uh, in Boulder, and I will be promoting to all the dispensaries in Boulder. So just so you know, um, and I'm sure you guys had a presentation a couple months ago from the SEA, uh, the Substance uh, Education Abuse uh, Grant, um, and I get funding from them, and I did include that in that package. So you all could see I'm in a five-year grant to provide this program, RAR, to the community of Boulder. Uh, we were more heavily focused in alcohol at the beginning, but we now really want to push forward with the cannabis side of things. And um, with your blessing and your support, we would really like to move forward that and grab with as many dispensaries and industry members as possible to join us and join what we're trying to do with our code of ethics and our responsibility and keeping it out of the hands of children. And we do uh, when I say that, I do consider a 20-year-old a child at that, legally speaking. They are not allowed to consume cannabis legally. So we do want to do that, educate college-age people about ramifications of having it and what happens if you get caught with it and everything like that. And those are things that I offer during trainings as well. Um, we also do something called ID compliance checks, which are more effective on the alcohol side. I hire somebody between the ages of 21 and 30. And I just have them go and get ID'd and they must be ID'd properly. So they have to be checked. They have to be looked at thoroughly. The, the person who has the ID has to hold the ID. And really, I mean, it's few and far between that I'll ever get a bad check on a dispensary because of the two security checks they have to go to. And a lot of the places nowadays ha have scanners and they'll, you know, really good state of the art scanners that like the police use. So if they're using those and they're using their ID guidebooks, it's very hard to fool them, but it's still nice to have someone go through and, and watch your employees and see their process. Are they really holding that ID up to that person in front of them? Because my state ID right now has a picture of me from when I was 28 and I'm 45 almost. And that's because of COVID. So are you really IDing that person in front of you and my person sitting there taking notes? So I have a green check, a yellow check and a red check. And my yellow check essentially for dispensaries is bad. If you got a yellow check, it means you're not really thoroughly checking that ID. You're just 
being lazy and and going through the motions of the scan or something like that. We really want them to be thorough in, in their practices. And that is something I train them as well in trainings on proper IDing and things like this. Um, we work really closely with law enforcement. I know um, uh, Officer Pam and I have talked a couple of times um, off and on, but I just wasn't ready and ramped up yet. And that's why I really finally approached you all now is because I've been able to train my assistant to kind of help me with boulder alcohol side of things because the next six months of my life are going to be really concentrated on grabbing as many dispensary and industry members in boulder um and get them to join rar and what we're doing and again that's i hope i hope and pray with your support but if not i still want to get in there and really promote what we're doing because we're doing some great work in communities uh we've had some proven results of um, helping dispensaries really um, go from bad to good when their practices were terrible. And now they're, you know, one of the best dispensaries in Colorado as far as those practices go. Um, just so you all know too, also for the past, I don't even know how many years now, probably at least five years, I've been on Gov Governor Polis's Marijuana Education Oversight Committee for the state of Colorado. Um, kind of as that voice of reason in the middle. Um, I'm sitting there with industry members. I'm sitting there with people who are super anti-cannabis. And I'm just kind of in the middle like, hey, what's your thought uh, process for the kids, for advertising? Um, it's nice just to have a voice at the table when CDOT's making an ad campaign or the Colorado Department of Health is developing something for high schools. It's just nice to know, A, what's going on beforehand, B, having a voice at the table, and C, just letting my members know that, hey, we actually do have a voice also uh, with what's going on in the state and education as far as that's concerned, um, because I think both sides can get a little crazy sometimes, you know, um, and both sides have great points sometimes, and we just all need to come together um, and be rational and just figure figure things out for the benefit of the kids in our community and patrons in general and, and the Colorado citizens. Um, the other thing I added was something uh, like an alcohol policy. So I also help folks with their licenses, their alcohol policies. Often the BLA will say, hey, um, what's your policy for getting people home safely or serving intoxicated folks? And a new licensee may not really know all of those things. I luckily, because I've been doing this for over eight years now, I have a lot of knowledge on these things and I can help them really understand what they're moving into and how to put their best foot forward and their best face forward for the journey into this. And with cannabis, for me, it's even more of a, not that alcohol isn't serious. I think cannabis is just something that is so new still that um, a lot of folks don't understand the ramifications of what they're doing, uh, both socially as well as legally. And that's something we can help provide for them as well as just a wealth of knowledge and contacts um, for them to have. Um, other than that, yeah, I don't really have too too much to add to that. I just really wanna just press, oh, I'm sorry. Also, just so you know, um, my parent company now is a place called Partners, okay? And Partners is a large nonprofit that's been around in Broomfield, Greeley, Denver, Fort Collins for over 40 years. So they adopted me when Team Fort Collins went out of business. Uh, because they believed in our program, and we've grown since since we've been adopted by them. So I'm really happy to be with them, and they are a youth mentoring um, nonprofit, and we now just rebranded from Partners Mentoring Youth to Partners because RAR is a part of that as well. Um, so I don't want to take up too much time because I can I could go on forever with what I do. I love my job and what I do, and uh, I'm, I'd be more than happy to, to answer your questions, but I would just really like to say at the end of the day, like, it would be awesome to have your support. Having the BLA support the past three, four, five years um, has been amazing. I think as time's gone on, we've gotten more and more support from them to the point where they're even suggesting, um, not suggesting so much as just asking if folks have joined RAR. And if they haven't, kind of asking why not. And I like that because that means that we're doing good in the community of Boulder and the surrounding areas. And we've... Um, we're being appreciated. We got written on for another five years on that grant from the SCA. So that's the other thing. So, you know, um, all the other RAR members pay $350, um, which is put into trainings and, and materials like black lights and all these things, right? Well, Boulder's very fortunate. You, the members in Boulder only have to pay 150 a year because the city and county, that grant covers the rest of their um their dues so really it's it's 
it's a no brainer for me to go into a place and just be like, Hey, you're just going to pay 150. You're going to have this sort of knowledge. You're going to have these sort of resources and you're going to have free monthly trainings because they are free. They're included within that plan. Right. Um, they just have to pay for the, for the manuals to be printed, which is like $10. Um, but they get five free trainings every year. Every staff member after that, they pay for the manual, but me coming to them and doing personal trainings in house or monthly trainings, I hold them mostly at the Boulder library because it's just a good place to have them in a central location. Um, those will be monthly and religious, religiously held, and they can be assured that their, their staff are going to be knowledgeable when they leave my doors on, on state, not all state laws, but on state regulations that they need to know, um, understanding that we can't play doctor, right? And those sorts of things, they shouldn't be telling people that it cures cancer and this and such if they're on the rec side. Um, we also, also are moving away from the word recreational, and we prefer adult use. Um, to recreational because recreational promotes um, fun. Like I go to the recreational center with my boys to go swimming. Um, so we're kind of been really pushing people to stop saying rec and start saying adult use because that's what it is. It's adult use, if, unless it's med. And and just so you know too, I don't really mess with the medical side of things. Um, I'm happy to 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 discuss them and to to do what's necessary. But we feel that's between a, a physician and their patient. Um, but we don't want bud tenders pretending like their doctors are acting like doctors. And that is something we do promote. Um, so sorry, like I said, I could go on forever. So if you have any questions, please let me know um, today or in the near future. And I would really love your um, support, your backing, if anything else. And also, just so you know, it is required that I do go to the majority of the uh, BLA um, hearings like this one, I would attend all of these that I could. Um, I, you know, sometimes I have some personal things going on that I can't, I can't change or a vacation or something like this. But other than that, I try to be at every single one of these hearings just to, to listen in and be a voice and report. And I do reports on members and such like that. Thank you, Nathan. Questions for Nathan? Well, I'll start things off. Oh, Robin, you, oh, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Chair. I just appreciate the presentation, Nathan. And if you covered this, I apologies, but two questions. Yeah. One, how many people, how many lice, I guess I have three questions. How many licenses are currently members of RER? Um, that $150 a year, is that just per license? Um, and then are you? do you have a specific ask for CLAB other than you know, support that we would provide some support. You said that the BLA has supported by asking people, are you an RAR member? And if you're not, why not? But we're not doing the hearings just yet. So I don't know if you're wanting a, a letter of some sort or yeah. Well, just about yeah, that. no, that's great, Robin. Um, so we have 12 licensed um, establishments. Like I said, I, 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 I just didn't want to get into Boulder too much before talking with you all. I just wanted to let you know what I was and who I am um, so that you can understand um, before I move forward. But uh, like I said, I've, I have talked to some places in the past, um, both industry members like Green Dot Labs and um, the farm and things like this, just to kind of get the feelers on, on how they would do it. So we only have 12 right now, but that's, again, only because there's limited licenses. You can only have like 11 in Fort Collins, I think right now, and Greeley has a limit and, and such. So um, it would be more, <laughs> I'm sure if we could have more up here, we would, and I, and I would get them to join. It's, it's pretty much been a no brainer on that side of things. Um, and as far as your support, really, it'd just be nice to go in and say, hey, RAR is, um, you know, you guys are aware of us. Um, for maybe lack of a better terminology, we're we're working together because I would like us to, we're cooperating something like this, collaborating because I would love to to be able to help you with some of the issues. Like literally, there are things that we can't get into today, but you all have already talked about that. I I feel I could wax some knowledge on and help you out with. And if not, I know resources where to get those answers and how to get those answers, or going to the dispensaries myself and saying, "Hey, how did you get this many IDs when you haven't collected a single ID?" in 
three years, whatever it is, right? Um, so I guess in that sense, it's just like once you do have hearings and you do have that kind of license control, it is nice for them to know that they have a resource to help them out and make sure they're doing the right thing in the community. And I think that's the BLA thing. Like I never asked the BLA to ask them. It's just something the, the board does on their own. I would not ask for that kind of thing, but I do I appreciate it? Of course I appreciate it. Um, and it's gotten us business. And it, and honestly, I'm telling you, a lot of the people that, that they've said, hey, do you know of RAR or have you worked with RAR? Those are the people that have needed us the most. There's a few times when there's a person who's like, I've been doing this 40 years. I know what's going on, blah, blah, blah. I get it. That's great. Um, but there's some people who are green. You know, it's their first business. It's their first bar. It's their first restaurant. And they didn't know X, Y, and Z. And I can provide X, Y, and Z. So I guess for me, it's just like them knowing that C-Lab knows we're here, um, that you appreciate the work we're doing and or understand the work we're doing. Um, that's just the start, right? You know, um, so and and I think the work you all do is super important after viewing what the BLA does, because, um, you know, in a lot of the other communities, it's a judge I work with or, you know, offense, Kristen, a clerk, someone like that. Right. So it's a little bit different working with a group of people, right, like yourselves, because you all have your own individual thought, your own individual experiences that are going to lead into that, those licensing hearings and things like that, um, and your own and your own professional experiences. And that's something where, I, again, I can just be a resource to you all behind the scenes or right there at the hearing. Sometimes I'm called on at the hearings for the BLA, um, or sometimes I just report on things in the community, like, hey, um, you know one of the members did this or one of the members had this issue and we've been able to clear it up just to show you guys on the other end that hey this member that you cited for you know doing something incorrectly I went in there helped them with it and they've turned themselves around that kind of thing so it's also a resource for you to use for someone who who you may want to help out you feel like oh we want to give this person another chance and maybe Nathan Dewey can go in and help them with RAR that kind of thing so I guess that's that's the extent of that for now Other, did, uh, Robin, did you get your questions all? Okay, other questions? All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm, I have a few. Sure. Um, I'll see if I can remember all of them. Um, so the limiting factors as to why people might not be involved with you is number one, money. Although that's augmented. In, is it just Boulder City or Boulder County or Boulder City and County or? It's, I mean, I'll be Boulder, it's Boulder City. I mean, the main focus is Boulder City, but it is Boulder County as well. And so I'll be, I mean, we had, a, we have a member in Gun Barrel and then um, Longmont. I'm going to go approach people in Longmont as well. And just so you all know too, I'm born and raised Longmont. So Boulder's like second home to me. It's where I got all my drugs in, in high school. So, I mean, like not to laugh, but it truly is. And that's just another thing where I, I don't want my kids going to Boulder and getting their drugs from there. You know what I mean? So it's another thing just to reinforce uh, responsibility there. Um, if someone does have an issue paying, um, you know, between all of us in the long run, I would rather them be a member than um, not join because they can't pay. So we have payment plans and we can sometimes work some things out with them so that it's more affordable. Um, definitely. Obviously, I can't take everyone on for free, but I don't think everybody would want to be. But if I have somebody who's really strapped for that 150 for a year, I mean, I can spread it out if they need to, or we can let it go for one year. I mean, to be quite honest, we let all the dues go for all the alcohol members during COVID and the year after COVID because people were struggling so much, which did make us struggle because we are a nonprofit, you know. But thanks to the C grant, um, we we kept Boulder really strong. And Boulder's the place where I, I lost the least amount of members during that time. So there's ways around that, Tom. So um, another kind of tangential question is, in some municipalities and also maybe in Boulder, with respect to the alcohol issue, our instant or licensees or whatever whatever we want to call them, our businesses yeah. are required to have um to have gone through RAR or is that is that reached that point or so 
Yeah, no, no, nobody's required. But like I said, the the BLA recently, um, and I'm, I know maybe Kristen can speak more on that. But the BLA in the in the past, I don't know what six seven months, maybe a little bit longer now. Time's been going kind of fast. Prior to that, it was like a ninety day limit where they said they had to be responsibly trained in tips, right? Mm-hmm. And I provide that essentially for free because it's fifty dollars a head. 50 to 60 bucks ahead, a private tips teacher comes in, instructor comes into Boulder or is in Boulder, and he's charging or she's charging, they're charging 50, 60 bucks ahead. Okay. I come into town, you pay me 150, I give you five free trainings. That's a hundred dollar value right there because I charge you $20 per manual because that's the cost of the manual. And I'm a nonprofit, right? Um, but the training's free, my hours are free because that's paid by the nonprofit. Okay. Um so the only requirement now in, in Boulder, to my understanding, is a 60-day re- limit where within 60 days, they have to have a TIPS training um, for their staff to work. Now, on the marijuana side of things, um, all I can, can can seem to see is the MED is saying that if you take the time and responsibility to get all your folks trained and you can prove that they have had this training, like I offer a certificate for tender-wise, um, they will mark you as a responsible vendor. So that's where I was like, at first, when I heard like, oh, you're mandated in Boulder to do it. That's kind of weird. Now I'm totally for it. Like I've changed my thought of mind. I'm pushing for Collins and Greeley to do the same thing. And I wish the MED would honestly do the same thing with their bud tenders because someone like myself or the other trainers who do, um, responsible vendor training for marijuana, we, we have a curriculum we have to follow through the state. So the state's telling us to follow their curriculum for our manuals. And if we go into their dispensary and we train all their folks, those that dispensary will be um, viewed as a responsible dispensary. And should they get an infraction or something, and it's not too negligent, obviously, that, that will be a mitigating benefactor. So really, that's what I'm kind of asking for, too, eventually with you all, if you get into the licensing and such. Like consider doing what the BLA does in that sense, um, where you say, hey, we need your folks, even if it's just Boulder and it's not the state of Colorado, we need your folks um, trained, whether it's by me or another bud tender trainer, it doesn't matter, but we need proof that this person has taken the state curriculum required by the MED if they're going to be selling or, you know, working with, with marijuana. Does that make sense, Tom? So yes. like nobody's really adopted it. That's what I'm pushing. <laughs> and I saw both Kristen's unmuted for a moment. Did you want to say anything? I, I, I noticed your little red thing went off. So did you want to comment? It's okay if you don't. I, I don't have anything to add unless anyone has any questions about um, our current practice for responsible vendor training for the BLA and liquor licensees. Okay, so then I'll, I'll use that as a segue to, I don't know if you got a chance to review our uh, packet from today, but we're going to have the presentation following you probably after our break um, is uh, the folks who uh, looked at, I did a meta-analysis of the cannabis, the concentrates. And I, I guess my overall question is, are you, are you staying current on that? Are you collaborating with folks at the state level? Um, and how will you incorporate um, new information, I guess, especially, uh, I don't wanna steal anyone's thunder because they'll, they'll talk no, about- No, no, you're fine. So I, yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm, on, gover- I'm on the governor's, at MIA, they call it the MIA committee, which is the Marijuana Education Oversight Committee. So we get a lot of information that way. I work with the Colorado Department of Health uh, so I get my information that way as well. And I and we do work with the MED as well. I try to stay abreast of the concentrations and the things like that CDPHE wants to kind of put out there. Um, like, for example, Tom, in the past, uh, CD, CDPHE um, approached me during one of the MIOC um, meetings, and we collaborated in a way to really push out the knowledge about breastfeeding and, and THC. Because it's not like you're, it's not like with alcohol, right? It stays in the body. And so what I was able to do is make these little pamphlets that went out with every single sale at every dispensary. And it's not them playing doctor. It was just, it was provided to me by the CDPHE. 
I helped collaborate it and did a little graphic design on it. And then all of my members for six months straight with every single sale was putting that out there. So for example, let's say you wanted something or, or the state or CDPG wanted something out like the dangers of really high concentrates of, of, of THC, right? My members, even though they're selling it, a lot of them would put out information that is possibly even going against their sales because they, especially if it's youth oriented and things like this, um, because they want to, they really do, the members up here in Fort Collins, they really want to promote um, their responsibility. They don't want to hurt their patrons. They don't want to hurt kids. They don't want to promote anything that's too negligent. And a lot of the places that don't join RAR are the places that that do want to promote those things, if that for, you know, lesser, for a better, I don't have a better way of saying that. The people who are shady aren't going to join RAR. Let's put it that way. But those are also the people that I go after and say, hey, you need to join RAR, right? Because you're seen as being shady and that's not good. And you're going to get in trouble or you're going to get one of your employees in trouble or you're going to kill one of your patrons or whatever it might be to be the extreme, right? Um, so yes, I do I do try to keep up on all of it as much as possible. I have to redo my my vendor training every two years. Um, just like the just like the bud tenders need to recertify every two years. I have to put my program up for recertification every two years. Um, and I do like, okay, um a couple months ago when when we talked about about um the overuse of marijuana and how people can become ill, violently ill. You know what happened after that? I made pamphlets and I had people put that information out to their customers because there's tons of people who may be using marijuana but are getting sick from it and they don't know it. They think they're, they're they think they're trying to cure that nausea when in fact they're only reinforcing that nausea, right? So that's the kind of thing where we just try to generally educate folks and our members, you know, let's just say nine out of 10 of them are on board all the time with wanting to do that. So a very specific um, ask, because um, we had this discussion when we were talking about cannabis hospitality suites. Yeah. We concerned about people drive, are people getting home from those institutions or those places? And um, I noticed in your, it's in our packet page 24, it's in your membership benefits. Yeah. You have special codes slash discounts to Z Trip, Z Uber, and other local transportation companies. Is that? Um, I'm assuming that's obviously for alcohol, but uh, is that it's for everybody? No, it's for it's for THC too. It's for for it's for cannabis. What sort of discounts uh, does one get? Well, like the Uber only they they only gave only but they gave us they gave us like a free first ride. Um, Z Trip gives like five dollars off a ride. These sorts of things, and it changes. The promotions change from time to time, and they'll give us seasonal like. During Christmas and stuff, we get like 10% off the ride, 20% off the ride. It, it, it changes all the time. Um, and it's just what can they do? What can they offer us? Um, but just so you know, too, Tom, because you just brought something up to me. Um, like I said, I work with CDOT. And actually, we're part of a campaign right now in northern Colorado called um, uh, No DUI Colorado. And what that is, is a drunk and drugged driving campaign to teach people to make the call to 911 right um so that's the kind of things that's kind of actions we take as well we helped inform people in fort collins that all these signs that say um you can't park overnight or you're going to get towed well a lot of the signs were false and it's been that way since i went to school there 20 years ago and one of my friends got a dui because he didn't want to leave his truck overnight in one of those spots so we've actually made maps and um, you can go online now and you can see where you can safely park your car. And that's for everybody. It's not just for alcohol. RER is not just alcohol focused. We used to be Responsible Alcohol Association, but when we incorporated cannabis, I changed the acronym to Responsible Association of Retailers. Um, and that's because cannabis has the same thing. I mean, like you take a 97% dab or pen and you're just as messed up as if you you drank a bit you know what i mean quite a bit you, you should not be operating a motor vehicle and the other thing tom just so you know what i'm doing up north right now uh like my main thing is you, you are not better driving high drugged driving is a problem okay like me growing up in the back streets of boulder county in longmont i used to drive 
smoking a joint because my friends were wasted and I could drive really well high, right? Well, I know now after tests, after driving simulators, and, and we just got federally authorized to do what, what labs where they get people drunk and drive on close courses, they actually were able to get people high different ways and have them physically drive. And let me tell you, nobody's better driving high. And that's the kind of information we're disseminating right now in Northern Colorado. And that's the kind of information I will be disseminating through the same campaign with no DUI Colorado into Boulder County as well. So right now it's in Weld and Larimer County, Boulder County should be next. Okay, any other questions for Nathan? Okay. Um, well, uh, once again, thanks again. And uh, thanks for doing what you're doing. We appreciate it. I think we all do. Um, and I think we shall move on in the agenda then. Great. Well, thank you all very much for your time. And please feel free to reach out to me at any time if you have any questions. And I'll be in Boulder a lot these next six months. So I'd be happy to meet any of you in person for coffee or, or whatnot. My treat. Let me know. Okay. I'm not sure. I'm not sure we can accept that. But... I know. You, oh, maybe you can't. Sorry. So but you pay for yours. I'll pay for mine. But we can have a conversation. <laughs> That'd be like you treating or or me treating. That's true. That'd be like is that like lobbying. I'm not a lobbyist. I'm just a prevention specialist. <laughs> but thanks a lot. Thanks for the offer. Um, okay, uh, so it's four twenty four. Uh, Jonathan and or Megan, do you want to weigh in? Because it's going to. We usually take a break around five. But it, but it can be usually well short of that. So the question is, would you rather have us take a break and have our full attention, undivided attention, and not, not be well, thinking about when we're going to go to the bathroom or whatever? <laughs> yeah, this is John. I'm sorry. I'm actually on the East Coast, and I'm going to run out of time. Oh, so okay. Well, then let's, we let's get started. On, that would be okay. And let's get uh, started then. And then we appreciate okay. the, the fact that you've come on with us, though. Okay, great. And uh, actually, Megan uh, will show some slides and I'll dash through um, a huge body of work that our team has been doing and then point you towards the resources where you can find out um, more um, about it. And uh, let's see, uh, Kristen, our colleague, uh, Ashley Brooks Russell was among the participants. If she could be promoted to a um, participant, a panelist, that would be good. Great, thanks, I see Ashley's on. And then she uh, can share the screen. Yeah, let's see, Megan, I think, is going to share screen here. Sure, okay. Yes, give me one second, and I'll have it pulled up. I'm on my phone instead of my computer. Jonathan, I always I always get confused when I look at your last name, and I'm trying to not butcher it. Um, so yeah, how do you pronounce it? It's as easy as it looks, Sam it. Okay, all right. I just didn't want to say it wrong. That's yeah, no, no, sure, sure, sure. And um, I'll get started while this is... Um, Coming yeah. up with some. Kristen, uh, I'm going to um, log in via my computer. So you might need to um, promote me again. Okay. And I'll, um, I'll go ahead and get started. And actually, I will say, by the way, I am a Boulder um, resident um, and so particularly interested in, um, in this and pleased to have the opportunity to present. So we've been working a fairly large team, as I'll show you. Um, with funding from the legislature under House Bill 1317, which was uh, passed in 21 uh, that covered high potency uh, uh, marijuana and concentrates. And part of the uh, mandate in that was for the School of Public Health uh, to do a number of tasks under the direction of the Dean of the school. And I held the title of Dean until uh, August 1. And so I'm now, uh, happily the uh, former Dean of the Colorado School of Public Health, but continuing to lead this um, effort. Among the things that we were mandated to do, the two principles were to do a systematic review of the evidence related to uh, high concentration, uh, high potency marijuana and concentrates. And also then based on what we learned to put together an educational campaign for the uh, state. And at this point, we've completed a massive system of scoping review, which means a broad look at all the evidence that's available. And our team is um, building the foundation and 
to develop a set of statewide campaigns that would reach to the many different groups that um, might uh, might consider use of this range of um, products. So let's see, Megan, how are you doing on sharing? Um, Kristen, could you enable sharing? Let's see, we'll get there. So as you'll uh, see when we get to the- um... Kristen, you're talking, but you're... oh, there you go. Sorry. Um, Megan, I, you should be able to share. If not, I do have the PowerPoint pulled up and I can share. Yeah, I'm getting um, a little pop-up that says it's disabled. So I might need you to do it on your side. One moment. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. There we go. There we go. So I think um, I've already taken you through. So if we can go to, uh, yeah, slideshow, great, thanks. And continue on. So this is, of course, the bill. And the next one is our tasks under the bill. And that was to conduct this uh, systematic review. And we'll tell you about what we've done. Identify gaps in needed research. Establish a scientific review council uh, with 11 members the members being specified in the bill and produce a public education uh, campaign. So continuing on, uh, it takes a large team to do this. This is our scientific review council members uh, who were mandated and uh, they've been uh, very helpful uh, in guiding us and providing a broad range of input, as you can see, based on their disciplinary backgrounds. Chris Urbina, our chair, was a former CDPAT director and somebody who's been in public health in Colorado for several decades. Uh, next. So just to go through some of the things that we have done, uh, House Bill 211317 was passed back with the uh, 2021 legislative session, and we quickly moved into doing the work that we were mandated. Um, as you'll see, we took on an enormous task with the report, which was not delivered within a year, but delivered about seven or eight months uh, into um, in after the uh, year. We are de developing the, uh, as I mentioned, the back educational campaign. And I'll take you there. And we've gone on to a number of uh, different uh, reviews. Uh, next. So uh, in terms of what we've done, is completed this scoping review and we'll tell you how to access it. Uh, we have publications that have gone off to the uh, scientific uh, literature. We are proceeding with a review focused on the mental health outcomes and the effects of these products uh, on uh, certain adverse uh, consequences. And as I mentioned, uh, working on the educational campaign. Next. So you can find everything, and, and Kristen has the slide, so you'll have access to this. But we have a website that um, includes all our reports, uh, the meetings of the Scientific Review Council, our presentation um, materials, and importantly, you can access the actual scoping review itself and sort through the many scientific publications uh, from which we've abstracted uh, the uh, results. So I would urge you to uh, go there if you uh, want to find out more about the project, because I'm having to skip lightly over the surface just because of its scope. Uh, next. So just to say what we did and go on to the next one, in terms of the review, this is some of the language of the um, act and this focus on the what the act uses, the words high potency. Uh, for us, that uh, means uh, more specifically high concentration. And there's not an agreed to definition of what high concentration may is. So we've cast a net pretty widely uh, in doing our uh, review. And for those of you not in the systematic review business, it means that you're going to, in an open, transparent way, go out and find all the evidence relevant to the question that you want to uh, address. Next. So our, our approach to this was a 
so-called scoping review. And what that means is we cast a very wide net and said, what can we find that's relevant to questions about effects of um, the uh, high potency products? And the specification from the legislature was not to focus on either adverse or beneficial. So we uh, captured literature that addressed uh, both. We have a published uh, protocol and the methods are available. And as you'll see, the core findings are. In a systematic review, you plunge deeper into a specific topic. And that's what we're doing now on the mental health um, outcomes. And then the next. So as I mentioned already, there's not a widely accepted definition. And what we did was we either relied on reports of concentration defined in some way within the scientific reports we looked at, or based on the nature of some product that was particularly mentioned that would have a higher concentrations um, and resins, others, or uses, dabbing, that would indicate a contact exposure to a higher potency project, product. And as I'll tell you at the end, and it's obvious to those of you who looked at the scientific literature, there's no standardization of how exposure is characterized or what products people are using, which is a complication and a limitation. Next. So the research questions uh, are here. As I stated, we had this broad look at studies that would provide us some information on the relationship of high concentration cannabis products with outcomes. And uh, we uh, also looked at case uh, series that provided um, information. Next. So the uh, methods uh, are here. We did this massive review and I'll show you the large number of um, articles we screened on the next slide. We ended up extracting data from those. Uh, yeah, you can go to the next and we'll flip back and forth a little bit maybe, Kristen. So if you go to the next one, you'll see we screened uh, uh, over 60,000 uh, references. <clears throat> in the end, to come up with 452 from which we actually extracted um, the uh, data. So this was a large project involving um, uh, a substantial staff and students to screen through these articles to identify those that were relevant. If you go back one, uh, we identified four policy-related questions that I'm going to show you that we used the scoping review to say how much uh, evidence there was. And the scoping review produces what's called an evidence map. Essentially, we have a tool that allows us or others, we make this publicly available, to screen through what uh, the studies are there. And this review goes through November of uh, last year. So in the next, so this just again was the uh, enormous number of studies. Then if you go one more slide, thanks. Uh, then there's the evidence map and it's fairly easy to navigate it. So if you're interested in how many studies are on sleep or driving uh, performance, for example, those can be um, identified. And again, uh, the QR code or our cannabis uh, policy project uh, can be looked at at the school's uh, website to find this evidence map. Next. Uh, and then we've gone from there. We have this review I mentioned on mental health outcomes. And we're doing two further reviews in support of the educational campaign to look at what we know about mass media behavioral interventions. We have a behavioral sciences group looking at this and then looking at the more sort of contemporary methods of, you know, TikTok and social media uh, in terms of uh, of reach because clearly an educational campaign no longer is something based around conventional media. Next. So um, the uh, I think we can skip these next couple. This is just about the mental health outcome studies. And you can see we're screening now a large number, 59 randomized trials and 97 epidemiological studies. And then we have these two other reviews in progress and we can skip the next two slides. Okay, and then we're gonna go on now to the results. You can skip this one. So the, the let me go to the review findings. And you know, just a reminder uh, that we are following the mandate of 
HB1317 uh, around <laughs> high potency products. So this was not a broad review of all knowledge there is on uh, the health effects of um, cannabis. So, you know, there have been other systematic reviews. The National Academies did a review in 2017. CDC, of course, National Institute for Drug Abuse have information available. So just a, uh, we understand there's a very broad literature. Our search was uh, focused uh, down around the questions that I mentioned. So next one. So I'm gonna go through, um, and, and we, we evaluated the scope of evidence basically by the number of relevant studies uh, available. And as you'll see, when we get to the four policy questions, the evidence was generally quite uh, limited, the number of studies available. And some of that reflects simply the limitations of the scientific literature. And then recall, of course, that these higher concentration products are newer in the marketplace. So there's still a relatively sparse and emerging uh, scientific um, literature. I mean, just for example, I think one of the earliest studies in the database is 1971 when people were interested in the respiratory effects of smoking uh, joints. Uh, you know, sort of now uh, products that were probably around 3% flour in, uh, in terms of THC concentration. Uh, next. So this is the first three uh, policy questions. And uh, these were questions that we developed. We reviewed them with our scientific review council. And, you know, again, here's policy questions. Are adolescents and young adults especially susceptible to adverse effects? And a very limited amount of data, as you can see, are individuals with pre-existing mental health conditions especially susceptible, and again, uh, limited data, some on adverse consequences and some on potentially beneficial consequences. Uh, one of our scientific review council members was particularly interested in question three. And again, not to minimize the importance of the question, it just turns out that in terms of the high concentration products, we don't yet have information on uh, effects on uh, pregnancy and pregnancy uh, outcome. For question four, there's a more robust literature if we go to the next slide. And uh, here you can see a range of outcomes. So if you go to the evidence map, you'll find that there are many different health outcomes that have been studied. Um, and they relate to neurologic, pain relief, of course, mental health, sleep. We looked at driving impairment uh, and other adverse effects. And again, you can see the number of studies here with uh, mental health outcomes standing out for the amount of information available. And again, with sufficient uh, information, we believe for us to do this more detailed systematic review that we are now um, involved, uh, involved in. Next. I, I think one uh, issue here, we put this slide together this uh, to sort of show the multiplicity of factors that influence the THC dose in the middle, reaching receptors in the brain and the health outcomes. And I, I think from the point of view of looking at this, we are focused in this review down in that lower left box where you can see our concentration measures. Uh, and in terms of addressing questions where the legislature might be able to um, address uh, the consequences of use through regulation. Concentration is one of the factors. And of course, there are many other factors that in the end will determine what health outcomes occur. And of course, there's a lot of individualization about this too, in terms of who people are, what underlying health conditions they may have, and uh, more. So there's a lot of complexity. And we address this um, in, our, uh, in our report. So if we go to the next. So um, this uh, slide is comes straight from the report. It has a lot of information um, on it. And I would say up front, this is a, a, a body of literature that is suffers from methodological limitations. It uh, suffers from having not so many studies right now applicable to the current marketplace because 
we always lag in looking at the products that are in the marketplace because research takes time. There's other methodological limitations. And I, I think one key point I want to make is that the fact that there's not good evidence or even no evidence does not speak to safety. So absence of evidence, again, should not be interpreted as implying that there's either no risk nor no benefit. It simply means we don't have knowledge. And there's a, there's a great deal of uncertainty. And one, one of the activities that we intend to undertake is to try and make the scientific literature better. Uh, we intend to convene a meeting of people who are working in this field to say, we've got to do a better job. Uh, you know, For example, there's no standardized way to take a history of use of cannabis products. And you can imagine the current marketplace with so many different <clears throat> options available to do research and try and understand even what people are using takes a, a great deal of effort. So the, the most evidence was there for mental and behavioral uh, health outcomes, uh, some pointing to possible benefits and some pointing to possible uh, adverse um, effects. And again, some literature on those with pre-existing mental health conditions. So we intend to um, uh, complete that systematic review. We uh, are hopeful that we will continue to track the literature. The resource we've built is substantial. There's nothing like it um, available. And we hope that this will be maintained to track the literature as perhaps it becomes uh, more, uh, more uh, mature. Uh, I, and, and we'll come back to sort of future activities and what we might do. If I can just go to the next, just talk a little bit about the education health promotion work, which has been under, under developed now for almost uh, a year, if we go to the next. Uh, and a lot of the effort there has been directed at um, understanding how to produce not one, but a series of public health edu education campaigns that will reach the right target groups in the right way across the um, state. And to that end, we've been doing a lot of work with different communities in the state, if we can have the next. Um, the, uh, we have the reviews in progress on methods that I've mentioned. We have community advisory uh, groups that have um, uh, had meetings and uh, worked with, um, excuse me one second, just gonna deal with one quick thing. Okay, uh, and have gotten input from various groups and I'll talk about what some of them are in the next, um, Slides, but we want to get the key messages uh, for the um, right uh, groups. And we've had a lot of uh, input from different groups, priority groups identified. Uh, next. And uh, we have done uh, work uh, with advisors, both youth uh, and adult uh, advisors, and uh, they have helped us in uh, identifying key questions and bringing uh, community members uh, in for discussions. Next. Uh, these are uh, the nature of the representatives uh, from different groups who we have um, reached uh, out to uh, across uh, at least the uh, eastern side of the uh, state uh, for now. You can see the different communities we've reached to. Next. And uh, we've had a number of different uh, members of our team uh, involved in doing these workshops, next. And uh, talked about the different kinds of methods uh, to use and what um, might work. And there's been a great deal of um, discussion about uh, particularly uh, newer ways to reach people. And we've had guidance on approaches, next. Um, let's see, continue on, sorry. And um, the we've had suggestions for toolkits, uh, for pop-up events, for a wide variety of different possibilities. These are uh, the range of geographic communities that we have reached to. Next. 
And uh, for example, the use of youth advisors, um, talking about focusing more broadly on um, youth uh, mental health and not trying to isolate cannabis from other things that may affect uh, youth mental health, peer mentoring, uh, again, pop-ups, uh, and uh, social media, of, uh, of course. And next, from the uh, adult side, uh, toolkits for adults to talk to their kids, train the trainer models, social media influencers, and focusing again on Youth. So we're now at the point where we're going to work on designing and piloting um, these uh, campaigns. Next, I think we're just sort of at the end. I recognize I've dashed through a lot. Now, I hope that you'll find the resources that I've pointed to available. And certainly I'd be happy to come back uh, with our team to um, answer questions. And I will say sort of in the immediate thing we are as researchers concerned with the quality of the research. We're putting together a paper right now on the problems we've encountered, plan to do a workshop on how to do uh, better um, research. We'll be moving forward with the uh, piloting of the uh, educational campaigns and completion of these other um, reviews. And so a lot of work uh, done by a very large team. So I I think that's the end. We're happy to ask, answer questions. And I don't know if my colleague, uh, Ashley Brooks Russell, would like to um, add in uh, anything. Ashley has been involved from the outset with the project. Uh, no, nothing to add, but happy to chime in uh, and help answer questions. All right. Questions? Go ahead, Michael. Jonathan, thanks for the presentation. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Uh -huh. um, back on slide 29, you had where you sort of broke down the, the, the studies and it, it said with respect to either policy two or policy four or question two or question four, that there was a moderate amount of evidence that supported the adverse effects of high potency THC. But then the other entry said that there was a moderate amount of evidence that supported the beneficial effects. Right. How do you, how does your agency reconcile that difference? Right, so uh, I'll correct, we're not an agency, <laughs> but uh, you know, so a couple, um, couple of comments. I mean, we were sort of given a instructions for a review that was not directed to the effects one way or um, the other. So one first point is that it is in this area that we are doing this deeper systematic review that will involve a, a, a more critical assessment of these studies. And I, I think, you know, in terms of getting at your question, which I think sort of heads in what would be the policy outcome of seeing effects sort of one way and the other way, what do you do? I think, um, I, th I think at the point where we've done that deeper dive, the full systematic review, we'll have the evidence available that would allow, would be better, I, I think better articulated for decision-making. I mean, I think decision-makers here have, there's a problem that's not unfamiliar. When the scientific evidence is uncertain, what do you do? And I think it's at that point that those who are making decisions have to decide, for example, whether precautionary approaches are what should be taken, certainly with youth, that is generally the direction that people follow in, uh, in setting policies. On this particular um, set of health outcomes, we will have, I think, a clearer answer, a clearer foundation for decision-making, probably within about two months. Michael, are you, are you good with that? Okay, Robin. Thanks, Dr. Samet. I appreciate the presentation. And I just wonder about ongoing stuff. There was a really large study that came out in May. It was an epidemiological investigation, a Danish one, that looked at 6.9 million people and said that about 30% of schizophrenia diagnoses could have been avoided if people hadn't developed a cannabis misuse disorder. 
And first of all, I wonder if a study like that would have been within your realm because it wasn't looking specifically at concentrates. And secondly, how do you, how does the work of your group, which is really impressive, how do you continue to look at emerging data? Because, right. sorry, go ahead. Thank you. No, I, I think so. You know, first of all, thanks. I'll have to go look for the study. And the the Danish and the, you know all the Scandinavian countries do these remarkably large studies because they can link everybody in the country, and um, and do database linkage, which unfortunately we can't do in the U.S. Um, but that, in fact, unless they had product information, would be a study that wouldn't come within the net that we cast. So that uh, would not fit. I mean, I, I think. Um, the the challenge here on this sort of newer marketplace is to try and be able as quickly as possible to understand what the kind of health consequences are and the the challenge is if we do an epidemiological study you know start now collect information about people and watch over time and publish a paper it takes a long time and sometimes i mean i've been through this in many other arenas, by the time the information everybody comes out and says, well, that was five years ago products. And so I think that's part of our sort of concern about methods and how do we do this. I, I'll, I'll just digress a moment. I've spent a lot of my life working on tobacco and we have faced a similar challenge now with the very diverse tobacco products out in the marketplace where they change quickly. And we identify that, let's say we have an epidemic of dual use start to study it and suddenly the marketplace has moved on to something else. So there's a there's a challenge here that we have to address to be able to give the best information. And folks like you have to make decisions. Can I add to that? Um, there are some resources that weren't, you know, developed with quite such rigorous methods, but our, you know, our state health department of uh has done and and is you know, conducting ongoing a review of the literature. And so if there's interest in the the degree of evidence and kind of similar statements of public health implications with moderate, limited, and uh, strong evidence, uh, CDPHE has resources in that area that are more current than the Institute of Medicine report that would be the, really the only other resource I know about that that compiles all the evidence in that way. So they would they would no doubt be looking at that Danish study if they haven't already, and be updating their their statements to reflect, you know, increasing evidence pointing towards that outcome. Robin, <clears throat> and one other question. Thank you for that. Is there a place where we can see the um, messages that you're developing? Like, is that is there a place on your website that has that in terms of the public health campaign? So probably the best place right now would be the website and our last meeting. So our team, the team doing the work has done the groundwork. Now the next step in fact is to develop exactly those messages. They will be aired. Our scientific review council meetings are all open. They're announced two weeks in advance. The scientific review council uh, has to approve the campaign. And so these will all be aired publicly at the Scientific Review Council um, meetings. Um, and probably the next one will be, we had one just about a, two weeks ago, and probably the next one will be, I'll say within two months. Uh, Allison? I just had a follow-up question to that about the, the materials and the campaign. So if the next meeting is in the next two months or so and everything goes well, when do you anticipate that those, um, that campaign and those messages would be out in the community? So I would see, you know, there's, in the end, we're gonna need to develop the messages, pilot them, and then turn to, I think, um, different vendors who can have the reach um, and to run the different campaigns and, you know, again, my, Hope is that we will do the message development, the pilots, and be ready uh, and ready to get going by some point in spring, late spring, perhaps of 
2024. I think that's a realistic time frame in terms of trying to really do all the basic groundwork to assure that the campaigns will be effective. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thanks for all your work in this presentation today. Sure. Thank you. Other questions? Stacy, I know you're just dying to ask a question. I don't have a question. I think it's great work. I'm amazed with what's happening and the focus of it. It's just frustrating that there is so little evidence. And at this point, with the way things are federally, uh, it's going to remain yeah. that way. And it, it just makes no sense. It's, well, yeah, no, you're, I mean, we're as frustrated as you are. I and know. Those of you who don't know, if you did research funded by the National Institutes of Health, you had to use this research marijuana from the yeah. University of Mississippi. Yeah. yeah. Three percent THC. Yeah, it, up That's to eight percent. It's irrelevant to what we're okay. dealing with. So, yeah. yeah, it's really kind of a silly situation that makes no sense, and yet we're stuck in it. So, I appreciate that you guys are doing what you can with like a dirt floor situation, so to speak, because yeah. somebody needs to. And hopefully, when the federal system maybe one day catches up it'll at least you'll have the infrastructure created like you've been working on and then it can just flow from there so that's my hope anyway but thank you for the work you do Thanks, and yeah. coming and talking hey, to us yeah and we'll be talking to NIDA about this and we've, we've already had some conversations so thank you so I too would like to echo everybody's uh thanks for doing everything you've done so far and we look forward to much more, I hope, uh, that will come down the pipeline. Uh, I'm gonna go back to Michael's question about the, the conclusions on page 29 and the difference between uh, you know, the two paragraphs, the policy question four and policy question two. And I'm sure this is something that you, well, you, you just alluded to that, that you wrestled with that you know, the, there's not enough evidence. Um, now, fortunately, uh, you know, we're in the state of Colorado. We do have, um, we've had, you know, marijuana um, legalized for a while. And um, we also have some of the, um, probably the, the biggest concentration of marijuana researchers in the United States um, at University of Colorado Boulder. And I just happened to chair the institutional review board also. Um, and um, and I, I see that Kent was on your, your panel. Right, right. And, um, and Kent was always good at, um, in, in, in the research, I know he's moved down to Anschutz now, of course, but uh, he was always good at casting a broad net, um, which sometimes included genetics or, you know, getting genotypes. And, um, and so one thing I was wondering about, and, and this is going to be pure conjecture for you, um, but, you know, the, the, the two contrasting paragraphs do you think that some of that has to do with a person's individual gen genotypes or even the or the cannabis genotypes and how they interact with a person's genotypes? And I'm going to go out on a limb here, if I haven't already gone out to the point of breaking a limb. Um, but there's some recent research out of Northwestern, which is not as big as the, you know, the was a Danish study or whatever, but, you know, it was a thousand um, study of a thousand adults and it looked at Gene or epigenetic changes yeah, yeah. that happen. And um, I just, I, I, you know, feel free to expound. I know, you know, it. Uh, yeah, I, so, my comment, I'm not going to go out on the limb with you. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think it's fair to say, look, new science is going to bring us some new insights. Let's hope. And um, you, but, you know, doing. I mean, you know, let's just take the epigenome, which, you know, everybody has been very hopeful will be a great, give us great insights into what we're exposed to across our lifespans. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll get there. Um, but to do, you know, and maybe some of the kinds of cohorts that are being put together uh, may provide answers. But if you look at where NIH is making big investments right now, the All of Us cohort, for those of you who don't know, this is a million people that NIH is hoping to put together to do the kinds of studies with the, the genome and the so-called epigenome, that's not gonna have much information about cannabis, I suspect. 
And, you know, to, to build the right studies and the right populations, you know, it goes back to what we want to do, which is say, how do we do a better job of answering questions? I mean, we have an important public health problem and we have, it's getting bigger. More and more states are, of course, you know, legalizing, I'm not going to use the word recreational, whatever we're calling it at the moment. And uh, so we've got a big challenge um, as, re as researchers to address and build a scientific foundation that, you know, you need and every everybody else taking on the similar responsibility for doing the right thing needs. So I, I hope we start doing a better job on generating the evidence that's needed. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess one comment is to try to cast a wide enough net that when they're doing, or when they're planning this study is to, you know, ask, ask enough questions. It's kind of like the twin studies that go back, you know, decades now. Um, they asked enough questions to, that we can gather information now, decades later. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Sometimes we have those resources and, uh, you know. And even now, I, you know, one of the good things or the, the great things is that, that um, people are starting to do double-blinded controlled studies on different strains of cannabis and their effects. And I mean, that's something that would have been unheard of, you know, five to 10 years ago. Yeah. And, um, and I applaud those that are trying to lead, you know, good science, I guess. So anyway, Stacy. Yeah, I think what Dr. Sampson said earlier was key and something that we can kind of do even with, you know, the situation being restricted as it is to create an infrastructure to collect data because we don't even really have that yet, right? I mean, there's so many products, there's new products to the market every day. It's like, how do you even, even in my practice where I hear about this stuff regularly, I hear about new stuff often. I'm like, oh, like I haven't even heard of that. And so collecting data in itself is already, you know, like a great starting point. Like, how do we do that? And um, the earlier speaker, uh, you know, sounded like a, a great resource for getting that on the ground work done. And so it's just kind of in my mind now, you know, I'm wondering how do you connect the dots? Because if we're able to get in and educate, you know, dispensaries, this and that, is there a way to somehow get in there and also find a common method of data collection that we can then hopefully one day use for research? So I, it seems like there are places to begin that are within reach that we could then use in other senses too, because, you know, from all aspects, it would be helpful to have that data, not just looking at cannabis research specifically, but for other industry measures, even licensing stuff. I mean, that's all information that would be really handy to be able to manage in a objective and consistent way between parties, between agencies, et cetera. So it seems like that could be somewhere we could focus a uh, start, you know, as opposed to just saying, you know, throwing our hands up and saying, well, you know, until something changes on a federal level, we're stuck. Oh, any comment or shall I go on to Robin? No, no go on to Robin, I think. I, I, I okay, only... and just another comment, Dr. Samet. You know, those of us who've had a loved one who's experienced a devastating health outcome feel this enormous frustration that these products are out there and we're still waiting on the, the research. We feel like it should be the other way around. And like my person had cannabis hyperemesis syndrome and that was devastating. And we had a panel on that last week and we learned that there's still not a hospital code to track that in Colorado. So it yes, to Dr. Green's point, there's definitely a problem that there's not the federal legislation, but in Colorado, we should at least be tracking what's happening in the ER. Yeah, and we, no, I totally agree. I mean, I, and we need, I mean, what we really need is a surveillance system that's robust enough to capture you know, things like the hyperemesis syndrome that are specific enough that are sort of sentinels that would tell us things are going on. I mean, child overdoses, you know, again, the poison control centers, we, you know, scan those reports. Ashley, you might want to comment uh, in your role with the Healthy Kids Colorado survey and 
you know, just speak to some of the challenges of trying to keep that survey current with um, what's going on. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the comments about the importance of surveillance, and um, and I, I was I am I'm also kind of shocked to hear about the hyperemesis not having a code because we we've been hearing about that for so many years. Um, so yeah, yeah, on the Healthy Kids Colorado survey, we were lucky enough to expand our questions about marijuana use before uh, legalization in 2014, and so I feel like our state has a a good a sense of um, trends but it is it's you have to stay on top of it we've had to add response options um uh you know like delivery service you know trying to anticipate is that going to be something we're going to want to know about so we have to add the response mm -hmm. option before you know it's a real issue and uh, changing terminology and making sure we're using the language youth would use so they recognize themselves in the question and it it is it is really a a challenge to anticipate problems before they're so big that that you wish you had a question or a data point on on it. Um, yeah. Any other comments on that? Uh, since, so at least you, Dr. Sam, live in Boulder, so you may be aware of what we all read in the daily camera or we don't read, uh, either or. Uh, but, you know, we made some important decisions with respect to cannabis hospitality suites that um, I don't know if you, I have a feeling you probably will say that you don't want to go out on a limb here either, but one of them was um, we decided as a board that 25 would be the cutoff to get into cannabis hospitality suites. We also um, made the decision to be safe, be safer rather than sorry and, and not allow concentrates, which of course that is something you know quite a bit about. Um, but yet, you know, even in, I don't even know when this was printed in the Daily Camera just recently, uh, sometime in the past two days, uh, the, the folks that write in, write the editorial comments say, this is just Boulder silly um, and our Boulder silliness. And, and you know, who are we and who, and then as you might know, that city council uh, decided not to, right. to move forward on this at this point in time. And um, so I just wonder, how do you feel about, um, you know, the, the reason, the re basic reasons why we decided not till the age of 25, because the general consensus is that's when the brain, you know, officially becomes fully developed and concentrates it just felt like you know, as, as you've already said, it's an unknown right. thing. I don't know. Go ahead. And... But I, you know, I, I'm, I'm aware of the city council um, decision and it actually reached out to the city council. I mean, I, I mean, the other side of this is sort of the normalization of, you know, using the products and sort of public commercial venues that I think comes with that, which I think is also important. I, you know, I, I I appreciate that that reaching into adulthood at some point in 25 is probably as justifiable as any other number around protection against substances that might affect the brain that's still developing. We have the same issue with with nicotine. And um, so I I mean I think there's two issues to me. I mean I, I think uh, I I, I don't know, I guess I don't think anybody knows about what the impact of uh, having hospitality venues where one can use, you know, THC products would be on actual use, whether it lead to sort of, you know, social binging as opposed to comparable to social drinking, let's say, um, with the, you know, the potential to have high births. And that's some pharmacology that goes a bit beyond me. And um, the, uh, other comment is, you know, the just the concern about sort of normalization, which, you know, again is a, a concern. Yeah. Ashley, any do you want to chip, chip in or no? Want to leave? Oh, I no, I was just feeling so grateful that John had to take that question because uh <laughs> we've ch I've chosen uh, you know, a career path that uh, didn't involve having to be a policymaker. So um 
no, I mean, I, I don't envy your, your position of having to make these decisions in, in the absence of evidence and, and in the face of uh, criticism. Uh, it's, yeah. Well, in the end, the city council gets to, you know, give the final say. We're, we're just advisors. But anyways, any other questions for the team from School of Public Health? Just the last comment. If you look at the material and you would like us to come back, let us know. We'd be happy to do it. You may not. You may wish you didn't say that, but okay. <laughs> well, let's hope not. No, we look forward to any future um, um, publications or information that we can, can glean. Okay, for sure. Uh, okay, so uh, unless uh, anybody sees a reason to do things differently, I'm going to call for a break. And, uh, and then we will resume what, where are we at? Uh, agenda uh, item eight? Correct. Okay, all right, let's do 10 minutes. I'll come Thank back you, Dr. Salmon. Thank you, and bye, thanks, thanks to all of you. Thanks for joining us today. And thanks for your work. To, uh, we're on to agenda item eight, am I right? That is correct. Agenda item number eight, matters from the city attorney. Yeah, hi. Hey, yeah, you got the stage, Andy. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so I, I think the, the big item, obviously last meeting we discussed preparing a draft of the board's procedural rules. So um, I don't know, Kristen, I think I can share. Is that okay if I share real quick my screen? You should be able to. And it's also in our minutes on, which I'm, I'm scrolling up, uh, page 52, no, 53 maybe? Yeah, PDF 53. Um, to, fifth to 65. Yeah, and I, I, um, it says host has disabled screen sharing. So I was um, going to, um, I can share if you would like. Um, I, I was going to actually share a part of the BRC and I can just read it out loud. Um, another option too, Kristen, if you make, um, Andy a co host, then you should be able to share that way. There. Andy, would you like to try now? There we go. Okay, I'm in. Um, so I just wanted, as we kind of get into this discussion, and I, I don't know that it's going to take super long because we just have, I guess, a, a big primary ask of each of the board members to go back and start at that PDF page 53 and give it a read and kind of within that, if there's any um, comments or questions you have to jot those down, but also if there's any proposed changes that you want us to consider, um, the goal is within these procedural rules to, um, I think, have a clear system for how we're gonna go about doing the board's licensing uh, approval and denial functionality. So, and this is just, I know the board discussed this back in, I think it was in May, but um, the BRC here has, if you can see this, the, the advisory board's licensing functions may include, and then it has this to grant or refuse applications for licenses to operate medical or recreational marijuana businesses. Um, as prescribed by, and then it has the two the two sections on medical marijuana and recreational marijuana. Um, it has this caveat, so the advisory board's responsibilities shall not include suspension, revocation, or imposition of fines. So that's sort of your out of bounds parameters. Um, and then the, um, 
this is another piece I thought worth highlighting. So the city manager shall issue all licenses granted by the advisory board upon receipt of the completed application, uh, the operating fee, criminal background fee, annual license fee, and any other applicable, applicable fees. So with respect to this licensing function, that's um, as long as basically we've received a complete application and all of these fees have been paid, um, the decision resides with the advisory board as to whether to approve or deny a license. Um, and then the another kind of piece that I thought worth highlighting, two pieces. So one is that it's really designed so that the advisory board doesn't provide uh, or doesn't perform any administrative functions as it goes about this sort of uh, you know licensing approval and denial process. So that's all still with the licensing manager and the city manager's office. And then the final point is that we don't have any authority over the land use code, obviously. So we need to request uh, an opinion of the planning board if there's some issue, but we need to be deferential in terms of zoning determination or anything of that nature. So they go through their own process basically. So. I just wanted to sort of refresh the board's recollection on some of those key points. I know um, you all had that discussion initially and you've all been thinking about this at some point, but that's really the board has its advisory functions and then its licensing functions. And this is really, I think, one of the first major steps to getting those licensing functions off the ground, so to speak. Um, and I'll stop sharing here. I think the before you stop sharing. Yeah. Oh, yep. Um, so right now, before the board becomes involved in this, and I'm just looking at the. Um, uh, it's hard for me to tell what number, but it's it's the part where the city manager shall issue all licenses granted by the advisory board. Blah blah blah. Yeah, exactly right there. Um, so right now uh the city staff would do this right right and does it all go smoothly do, like do they do they always pay every like, one two three four or other applicable fees would be four uh, does that all happen pretty routinely um or is it, like will there be situations where somebody's application will be held up because they forgot to pay something or whatever i don't know i'm just wondering and, and then there's a follow-up question after that but i'll defer to Kristen on that point in terms of whether it goes smoothly but i think the the point is is that your decision should be pretty dispositive in terms of you're going to be examining the issues, making sure that the application has met all of the criteria. And if it is, then you approve it. And then as long as, um, and Kristen can chime in, but as long as these are correct, and I think our procedural rules have a separate, um, I guess, verification process that occurs post issuance, but as long as everything is in order, um, that is the board's prerogative in terms of whether a license issues or doesn't issue. So Kristen, do you have any, or either Kristen, Kristen T or C, do you have any thoughts on, on any of that? I would say overall, it's a pretty smooth process, um, especially with fee payments. I mean, those are pretty transparent. So um, we don't usually have any issues with that. Sometimes the process can take a while um, especially when it comes to passing inspections. Um, I would say that's probably the biggest holdup, but um, our applications are usually in pretty good shape. And we, you know, we have the opportunity to review them and provide feedback to the applicants if they are missing information and there's some back and forth that happens there. But overall, I'd say it's a pretty smooth process. Uh, so, so they usually, they pay the fees, the, does the... Um... Oh, what did you just say? The inspection? What was it? That comes up all before it would come to us? Well, that's something that we would need to discuss um, with the board is how you'd like to see that process play out. Um, 
we do require inspections before we issue a license. Mm -hmm. Right now, the way that we operate with the liquor board is um, we have the public hearing with the board and receive their approval first. And then we do the staff inspection and then we issue the license. But, um, you know, that's kind of up to this board as to how you'd like to handle that. In addition to the application fee on the application, since it's an open book test, um, does it ever happen that someone does an application and they're not following the distance restrictions or some, you know, are there, are there other, are there, are they ever asking for exceptions to certain rules? Um, as far as the, the distance restric restrictions in the zoning goes, we, we try to make sure that they're compliant with those requirements before they submit their application, um, mm -hmm. just in case it's not a location that's allowed to have a marijuana business. They, they don't have to go through that entire application process first. Oh. Um, and as, then as far as asking for exceptions, I can't really think of a specific instance where that, that has come up. Hmm. Okay. All right. So hopefully everything will be like taken care of before it comes in front of us or it, it'll be fairly straightforward. I, I don't want to speak too much for Kristen because you all have done a lot of this with, with BLA. Um, but um, yes, hopefully it would be straightforward and you would have a straightforward decision to make. Um, I will say even plainly written rules, like when you get into the, the sort of facts on the ground and the real world facts, you might be surprised at some of the gray area that even the best written rules can have that you might have to interpret and make a decision on. So, um, I don't know, Kristen, if you have any other thoughts on that. Um. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I think there is a lot of room for the board to, um, you know, review and, and make a determination if something meets their standards or not, especially when it comes to things like an operating plan or a neighborhood outreach plan, you know, if the board feels like those are sufficient. Um, another thing to keep in mind would be, um, well, I was going to say needs and desires for marijuana hospitality, but that may or may not be something that we deal with. Um, but if we did, that's something that the board would need to make a decision about. There's not really clear guidelines there. Okay. Robin, did um, you... I'll... Go ahead. Uh, last thing I was going to say is determining good moral character of applicants. If we do have an applicant that has the criminal history, the board will need to make a determination as to whether they are eligible to be granted a license. That could get gray, you're saying. Okay, Robin? Does the staff give us a give a recommendation during the way what you described, Kristen, with the BLA, the way you do the public hearing first and then the staff does their inspections and fees and all that after, but in the first instance when it's heard is there a staff recommendation up front at all that goes into the hearing is that input there or not we do not provide the staff recommendation for the bla um, we do provide our preliminary findings where we provide a report of our staff's findings uh, but we don't provide like a final recommendation okay other questions So, Mr. Chairman, if you'd like, I can just hit on a couple more points with respect to the actual procedural rule draft. Um, yes, and we have to use chairperson. Oh, I'm sorry, chairperson, yeah. I'll put my pronoun of Z up or something like that. Um, I, I think the big thing, this is just an initial draft. This was derived from BLA, BLA's procedural rules. So it's not like we came out of this uh, you know, we, we had a pretty good model, I guess, that you could say we started building on. That said, I would encourage the board to think about what the board's needs are. Um, I think you'll see it's largely generic, which is a, a good thing in my view, but if we need to get specific with certain items, we can. 
it's always sort of a balance though, because this, this document could have legal significance if we were to get sued. So whatever we say in this document, we need to absolutely make sure we're as a collab board adhering to these requirements in our process. Um, it's good to be a little bit prescriptive to, to give our own selves some guardrails and make sure we're treating everybody equally and we're behaving consistently and that people know what to expect when they come into these proceedings. Um, but we also don't wanna be so prescriptive that we, you know, sort of um, restrict our own decision-making and how we do things. So an example might be, uh, Tom, you were just referring to, well, you know, we're going to have some of that decision making occur, but what if there's questions or further investigation that you all think needs to happen? There might be sort of some extraordinary circumstances where we need to, I guess, not follow our own procedure. And so that's, we want to be a little cognizant of that. Um, clarity, that's one thing that we've sought to do. So if there's anything that's unclear on your review, if you don't think you can understand a section, comment on it so we can work on it. Um, and and that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, we're really just looking for everyone to do sort of an individual review. And if you don't have any comments or thoughts, no biggie, but some, some way where we can get sort of a good initial draft and feed in some of those comments and changes before we bring something a little bit more final to the board for consideration and maybe just do a, a working session um, to, to review it and finalize it. So I don't know if anybody else, Kristen uh, or Kristen, if either of you have any other comments to add to that, but that's kind of the, the, the big picture. So. Do we have a date that you'd like to have that feedback by? Good question. Um, so one of the logical starting points for the board to actually start reviewing applications would be January 1st. And so if, if we were to work back from that, um, you know, I would hope that we would have revisions in time so that we could prepare another draft based upon your revisions and that for the next meeting, we could maybe work on um, finalizing that draft. So I think, um, Kristen, if you have any thoughts, chime in. Um, I don't know what your all schedules like, but it would be good for us to circle back with sort of all the revisions and discuss them and, and integrate them. I mean, I, I think if the, if I'm trying to think with our packet deadlines as well, like how much time we'd need to get that final draft into the packet and into the hands of the board. So um, I don't know, Kristen Teague, you can weigh, on, weigh in on this as well, but maybe like two weeks if that's enough time. And then, you know, if we can collect everyone's feedback in the next two weeks, that would give staff about seven to 10 days to incorporate it into a final draft and then hopefully meet the packet deadline. That is possible. However, two weeks, that's 14 days from today. That's the end of August, which leads right up into the Labor Day holiday, um, where we'll be discussing towards the end of this meeting um, what date uh, a September club meeting should happen. So that kind of gives us fluctuations. I think that two weeks is good as far as gathering. Whether or not that can actually go in a September packet um, would remain to be seen based on timing. So sure. if the, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm ahead. not sure you're going to get a whole lot of revisions unless, Ethan, are you seeing like a whole bunch, right? You're like you're just ready to jump on something? Okay. You never know, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, we, I, I guess we could shoot for, um, yeah, getting it into the packet might be tough and getting questions and comments. And if, if there are folks that have substantive questions, um, it, it would just be good to get those in advance of the next meeting. So we could try to get whatever 
draft we have available based upon that input ready for the next meeting. And then that might include teeing up some of the bigger questions or comments if there are any for that meeting. Um, but I think we wanna, I believe a meeting is scheduled in December or we're planning on having a meeting in December. So as long as we can get them adopted by then we should be okay. So do I hear then a uh, due date for um, preliminary board member comments and revisions um, Monday, August 28th? I think so, anybody opposed? Okay, let's go. Great, yep, that would be really helpful and we'll be curious to see what everybody's thoughts and concerns and um, and if you have none, great, uh, but it would be good if you could still read them to, to get familiar with them some. I know we asked this before and I maybe twice and I know we got at least one answer, but how many are we anticipating? Like how many per year or per month? Or... My understanding is it's not necessarily even one a month. No, it really fluctuates, um, and I think if we're if we are just talking about new license applications, maybe maybe five or six a year. But it it really just depends if we haven't had a consistent um, rate of applications over the past few years. Okay, that was that was my recall. Okay, any other questions? Allison? Um, I don't have a question. I just have a comment before we go to the next agenda item. Okay, go for it. I think we're ready. Uh, I just wanted to, yeah. yeah, just wanted to say, Tom, I know you uh, probably an offhanded comment that didn't mean any harm, um, but would ask that you not make light of folks' um, pronouns and use of pronouns and the importance of being gender neutral um, moving forward. Oh, no, actually, I'm, I actually am, I'm embracing I, I like the Z pronoun. So I'm not making light of it. I'm okay. I have used it in many scenarios now. I have not put it up on my screen, I guess, but yeah, and Allison, I'm I'm awesome. sorry Thank about you. that. Yeah, i I will I'll try to correct um my references. I just wasn't thinking, so sorry about that. No, was, no worries. And and thanks for the clarification, Tom. I appreciate it. We had a presentation somewhere around five or six years ago when I was still the medical director at Wardenburg on 21 different choices of pronouns. And, and I, I, some of them have gone by the wayside, but I'm not a big fan of they, because that sounds like plural. Um, and, um, and, and so I think C to me feels like it's gender nonspecific. So I'm sorry if it sounded like I was making light of it. If anything, I was actually embracing it. I appreciate that. Thanks, Tom. Apologies for misunderstanding. It's okay to call me out too. That's fine. Uh, all right, I think we're ready for uh, number nine. Oh, I mean, you know, it was actually kind of interesting when I was reading through, um, oh, I don't know if anybody saw the article or the, it's the editorial board, or what are they? The Daily Camera uh, people that write things for the editorial board, but they're community members. And every time I was reading through it, everybody kept talking about marijuana, and and now I'm sensitized to that too because you know, I just like wait, I can't marijuana. It's not supposed to be marijuana anymore. It's supposed to be cannabis, uh, except that's what the state still calls it. So we're kind of stuck with marijuana as it is right now, but but I, I, I'm trying to move forward on certain things. So I'm being educated. All right, we're on for matters, or number nine, yes. from the regulatory license. Yes, awesome. continuing on is matters from the regulatory licensing office. First up is our update, Marijuana Hospitality Presentation. 
Manager Changaris. Thank you, Kristen. Um, so just a quick update, I think everyone's aware, but staff presented to City Council on July 20th regarding the staff resources that would be needed to implement a new hospitality licensing program. Um, Council decided not to add hospitality to their 2023 work plan. So at this point, it's on hold until at least 2024 when the new council is seated. Does anyone have any questions about that? Well, I, I was, Brian and I were going to uh, mention this that, um, let's see, this is. Yeah, I just want to make sure this is the right place for that. But you know, there was a a um, Allison represented the board, um, and she was asked by officially myself, but so the, the staff had asked uh, for one of us, either myself or Brian, to just be present when the board presented to the city council. And it was all set that Brian was going to join virtually, if I think from Michigan or someplace distant. And then all of a sudden his schedule changed and he was unable to plan to be there. And so we kind of, Brian and I kind of scrambled and we, we had a short list of people that we um, considered to fill in for us. And Brian asked Stacy and I asked Allison and Allison replied first. Uh, and uh, and so the staff was excited to have at least one person agreeing to uh, represent the board just in case there were questions. And I, I, I thank Allison for stepping in, uh, especially at rather last minute notice. I think it was within a day or two of the meeting. And, uh, and so that's how it came to pass that um, how we, Chose who was going to stand in for the uh, for the city council pr presentation, and I'd be I will take any questions on that. Both Brian and I wish we could have been there, but Allison, did you get a chance? Were you were you called for questions at all, or were you, were you just? present or how did that work out for you? Uh, mostly just present. Um, I sp spoke right at the beginning. Um, Kristen let me know that there would be an opportunity just to say thank you to the city council and just acknowledge the work of the board. Um, so I did that at the beginning and then there were just a few questions um, because the vast majority of the discussion was really not about the substance of the recommendations. It was more for staff around capacity and priorities of city council members. Um, I was mostly just sitting, waiting. Um, I think the, the one question that I remember is if um, clubs had a specific timing in mind of wanting to implement the recommendations. Um, and I said from my recollection that the board wanted to know um, as soon as possible to get some direction from from city council, uh, but not necessarily when things would go into effect. Okay, thank you for coloring that. Any other comments on that from city staff, since you were all there too? Okay, are we ready to move on? Great, right. yes, agenda topics for future CLAB meetings. And do we have that list? That see. document is within the um, packet. Do you remember what page it's on? I mean, I remember seeing it in past packets, but I don't know if I saw it in this packet. Yes, it is in this packet. One moment. Maybe closer to the beginning. I am looking and I do apologize. It is normally there with the follow up recommendations for club meetings from the retreat. And I am not seeing it. 
Yeah, we got I can provide um, that if you'll just give me one moment. You want to share screen? If I am able to open that up, one moment. You know what's impressive when Kate's here is Kate would have it ready to go <laughs> and she'd be able to put it right up on the screen if we had, if we allowed her to screen share. But Are you talking that very large document, Tom? I think it was a one pager from, I can look up past minutes. Um, so what we do have as items that are included in each packet are procedures for motions, meeting for ground rules, and follow-up recommendations from CLAB meetings from the retreat. Let me get back into May's packet. Yeah, all that is there. And then I'm finding that that's like pages... Seven yes. Let me one moment. Everything's trying to um, download instead of open. Well, while she's looking for that, does anyone have any? There we go. You got it. I do. So while this is from the month of June, some of these things need to be updated as we did receive the update from the um, Substance Abuse or Substance Education Awareness Fund. We are looking at rules of procedure right now. We have talked about the meeting date uh, that we moved in July, forums, summer vacation plans, and virtual versus in-person determination meetings. We do have a secondary document. And we take these at each individual um, meeting. And we have a list of potential speakers and wasn't, um, that was the issue that city council approved that Robin can speak to us yes and that was on a list that included more than just not yes Robin, excuse me, that's that secondary Robin. piece I mean, which is coming right now over member malone excuse me Can you um, make that fit the screen better? Is it does it keep going beyond? It a... doesn't. This is being shared off of a team screen rather mm -hmm. than a document itself. And then there was the speakers here. Wow. Right, Tristan Watkins, I remember. We kind of suggested that maybe once a year we have someone from the Change Lab come. I thought. Or does anybody have any suggestions either based on what's in front of you or in addition to what's in front of you? I see member Noble has her hand raised. 
Okay, sorry. Thanks, Kristen. I sort of wondered if the board would be interested in exploring. So we talked about last time about changing the word marijuana to cannabis, but there's another the I think it was um, Nathan talked about changing recreational use to adult use. I think that's smart um, and would be interested in looking at that. I know we tabled that conversation because there's, you know, we have to wait until it's lined up with what the state's doing, but um, I don't know, maybe that's a future conversation. We might encounter the same challenges if we can't really change things unilaterally in Boulder is that, I mean, we might all agree that the name should be changed from marijuana to cannabis, but we can't really do that. Can we? I don't know, Andy, Andy, you were. He's thinking. Sorry, I was with the sharing screen, I was popped in where I couldn't unmute myself. Um, <laughs> I think maybe that's because I'm still a host. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, we can explore that. I mean, I, I think that brings up, I guess, broader implications of how willing we are to be inconsistent with the state, which isn't um, a huge deal, I guess. I just, um, I think if if the club wants to pursue that, I, you know, and the same thing with the cannabis versus marijuana, we, I mean, you had my thoughts on whether there was a technical difference that may create issues, but um, that doesn't mean either of those issues can't be explored or that that's sort of a foregone issue. Um, yeah, that's. Yep. Go ahead, Kristen. Um, I just want to clarify at the state level, they actually use the term retail instead of recreational. So it's actually a little bit different um, at the state level than what we use locally. Good point. Who did we have from MED? Maybe even more than one speaker, actually. Because I was thinking maybe this would be a good thing to dovetail with if we had Tristan Watkins come, who I presume is fairly high up in the in the hierarchy, and might be able to ex execute some changes at the state level, or at least influence some changes at the state level. Does anybody know Tristan? Robin, no. Stacy, no. I don't know what 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 is the what does the cannabis business office do? Maybe that's why we have to have this person come um, speak with us. It is my recollection, and I may be wrong, that the cannabis business office is part of the social equity. Mm. licensing that the state does. Mm. Okay. Well, if we invite them, then they can tell us what they do. Who did we, can you, how hard would it be to look up, or Robin, do you know who we had from uh, MED? Way back when, maybe two years ago or so? I mean, we had somebody not too long ago that was, that. Uh, I, I can see her face. I just can't think of her name. She's great. She's a good speaker. She came and talked about the enforcement numbers that, um, that the legislature looked at and considered a bill on, and that has something to do with that report that I mentioned earlier that I'll share in the next packet. But um, maybe we take a look at that report and see if the board members have questions coming off of that and uh and officer pam could probably weigh in on that as well as a subject for the board for a future conversation 
Okay. Do you want to have a speaker next time? I guess is ultimately what I was going to ask. I, a quick question, if you don't mind, Chair. I just wonder if the staff um, are working through anything where having the board take a look at something might be helpful in terms of licensing staff or your group, Andy. Is there is there, are there questions that you guys want the board to look at or need some weighing in on from us? I, I think it would be good for, I mean, at some point, the board will probably need an overview from licensing about sort of its process, what it does, and then the standards that are currently applied for applications just to sort of prep you all for sort of the issues you might see in your application review. Um, and that's frankly an area that I don't, I don't, I mean, I can see the CLAB uh, or I can see the BRC regs fine enough, but it might be good to, to maybe set some time for all of us, including myself to sort of have a discussion about what this looks like, what the standards are, how are they applied, where, where is certain information found in the applications, um, that kind of thing. So that's that's the only real thought I have as we get ready for licensing. Kristen, you're you're unmuted. Does that mean you want to say anything or no? Or both Kristens now. <laughs> Um, I, I would agree with Andy and also any feedback on the rules or procedure would be really helpful and any discussion around those so we can finalize them and get one step closer to the transition. Okay, so we can put that on the list for next meeting. But, I mean, I do know that the Change Lab has been doing some interesting research. Um, and so I don't know if somebody from that lab would be would like to or we'd like to hear from them. It could kind of dovetail on Dr. Samet's or the School of Public Health's presentation, trying to shed more light on research. which also fits with us having them here. When, when were they last year, roughly? I mean, has it been, has it been a year-ish? Staff could research and get back with you on that. However, doing that in meeting is, is um, yeah. difficult. You guys are the one who reach out, right? Or the folks, I mean, that reach out to potential speakers. We certainly can. It'd be helpful if someone has the contact information for who you'd like us to reach out to, but we can also just try to Google it if we get some direction from the board. Well, I could start the conversation. And Cinnamon would probably, the like, name that's up there on the screen would probably be the speaker. But I'd, I'd let them decide who they want to represent the lab. But that's only if people are okay with that. I don't think it'd be a lengthy presentation. Any other ideas? Ethan? Uh, it wouldn't be for September's meeting, but Alana Malone did say that she'll be available for October's meeting to do an educational uh, presentation for concentrates. So figured I mentioned it now so we can get it on the calendar. That was listed. It must be up above. 
Yeah. We can see that. Yeah, there, okay. Um, we hold there just for a moment. Don't scroll down. Is there anything else on this list? Okay. So October for Alana Malone. Anyone opposed to me asking uh, for Change Lab? to see if they'd like to present in the, on the tales of Dr. Samet's presentation. The, the only other thing that I would suggest is that we, you know, we heard the presentation from Nathan and he gave us a lot of materials to look at that are in the packet. And I don't know if the board wants to take any specific action around a recommendation of, of some sort uh, to our licensees or something along those lines. I, I don't I don't know. I don't know what our the right next step step is in terms of the information he gave us. And there might not be a tactile step to take, but um, just hate to have him come and give us all that and then kind of let it go. How did it work with the alcohol or it sounds like it's an expectation that they have some kind of training, which many of them choose that training, it sounds like. So all for liquor licensing in Boulder, um, all employees involved in the handling or serving up alcohol are required to complete a responsible vendor training within 60 days of hire, and then keep that training active by renewing it every, I think, three years. Um, the state has a list of approved responsible vendors, and we defer to the state list. Um, a lot of licensees do choose to do the TIPS program through a RAR, but there are actually a lot of different um, responsible vendors that are approved at the state level. Um, so for marijuana, there's a similar program, responsible vendor training that the state manages um, that's available on their website as well. So do you um, think, but that, do you think sorry, that have... training requirements actually outlined in the BLA rules of procedure. So Andy, I don't know if that's something that we would need to add to our rules or, or how that would work if the board decided to implement that requirement. Yeah, let's discuss offline i don't I, let me think about it yeah are you suggesting that the list would be almost as long for responsible vendor training for cannabis versus liquor it's not quite as long yet i think it's just a younger program there's aren't as many um service providers out there um but there's there's a, a few to choose from on the state website Okay, there's a list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the MED website, they post a list of responsible vendors. All right, so how about we let you guys discuss it offline and we might eventually come to the conclusion that, not putting words in anybody's mouth, but maybe we require them to have some kind of responsible vendor training. We didn't, I don't think we, I don't think that was in the list of motions that are at least for hospitality suites is it is there an expectation right now for uh, cannabis businesses are you asking is there a training requirement for cannabis businesses yeah there is not in boulder there's not interesting okay would that be in our purview are you asking if the board could add that requirement for businesses going forward yeah um andy do you want to speak to that 
Yeah, I, I, I think, um, I mean, that's, that's what I was going <laughs> to talk to you about offline was basically whether it could be something that the board would adopt on its own or whether it would have to be like a recommendation that it would make to council for adoption. Um, so that's, I, I think we would just like to discuss it offline. We can keep it on the future meeting work plan for sure though. Okay, can we add it? Would that be in, in the list of suggestions for future club meetings? I'm seeing a yes, a nod yes. Okay, I'll take that. Okay, um, does that work for you, Robin? Yeah, thanks so much. I just, I just think I just keep going back to that uh, policy suggestion form that we got that seems to say that we have a problem with bud tenders making medical recommendations and I want to explore this idea of uh, vendor training or bud tender trainer whatever it might be um, to make sure that's not happening. It, you know, in some for some bad outcome and I'm not even sure that we're seeing bad outcomes. I'm just curious about it. Okay, let's put it on the list. Um, anything else? All right, so Kristen, you wanna talk about the September 4th meeting date? Certainly, September 4th, which is the first Monday of the month, the scheduled CLAB meeting date is, of course, Labor Day. We are taking the temperature of a meeting date adjustment to another date. You want a yay or nay? Or you want to have people weigh in fourth versus first is 11th? Um, well, the fourth is a city uh, holiday, so no staff are available on the fourth. Well, that kind of solves that, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, because we can't hold it on the fifth, right? Um, we can explore at this date, we can explore other possibilities. It would depend on um, availability of not only staff, but of a quorum. The 11th would be the best workable option. That is being um, offered as a as a potential. Want to go around? Call, in, call out each board person. See what they say. You want me to do that? I can do that. Yeah. Chair Kinsman, September 11th. I'm good on the 11th, I think. Hold on. Come back to me. I mean, let me just make sure I'm not out of town. All right. Member Noble. I'm good on the 11th. I'm a definite no on the 5th. Member Daniel. I'll be coming back into town on the 11th. There's a chance that I would not be able to make that meeting. Member Christie. The 11th works for me, Kristen. Thank you. Member Green. The fifth is a definite no. Um, the eleventh, I can probably do. I might have to join a little late, assuming we're keeping the same time. But I, sh I might be able to make it work where I don't have to join late. But either way, I could do the eleventh, possibly joining late, but hopefully not. And um, ex officio Bailey, I know you're not a part of the forum, but I'm asking anyway. Great. Thank you. The 11, 11th works for me. Certainly. And Chair Kunstman, circling back with you. Uh, 11th works. I can, nobody suggested it, but I cannot do the 18th. The 11th is good. So I have one, two, three. It looks like we could potentially have a quorum. Okay. So September 11th. And thank you. So the next item would be um, just a reminder that the October meeting was the selected hybrid option. 
the meeting will take place at our Brenton building. Where is, where is the, oh, that's the one at uh, Canyon and Broadway. Is no, right? sir. No, we are at 1136 Alpine Avenue. Oh, the, new, the old hospital. Yes. Right. Former location for the hospital. Correct. Easy, easily findable by us. Yes, we would provide um, a, a directional link in there on okay. the meeting information. That was the October 2nd meeting, is that correct? Correct. Great. And the last item I, that uh, we have in here uh, on the agenda is summer quorum setting. In uh, June, we'd asked for um, people to email if they had any issues coming forward with uh, the remainder of the summer. We're just doing a double check here. I mean, we just adjust, addressed the September, so I guess the summer portion is a little um, redundant, but um, does anybody have any um, known conflicts for October? On November, December? Um, in October, we'll talk about the holidays. So if you can start kind of thinking about that, I know it's um, a little bit early, but not when you look at October, not really. January 1st is a Monday, assuming that will not yeah. be a meeting day. No. But we'll get to that at a future day. Correct. All right. Okay. Jen, I have 10. Sure, matters from the chair and members of the board. Uh, Andy, did you want to have any input before before the chair or any members from the board? Any nope, questions? I'm good. Have you had any further discussion among staff about attendance expectations? Yeah, so at, at one point, and this maybe harkens into the board's retreat, but I, I I don't know if the board will have a retreat before we would get a chance to do licensing, but I think some of the board members I've discussed with you, the importance of, um, I guess, member expectations when we're actually doing these hearings. So um, keep in mind, when we do a hearing, there's always the risk that if we render an adverse decision to the applicant that they don't like, that they could bring a lawsuit. And that means a judge could be reviewing our video and assessing what our decision making was and, um, you know, coming to conclusions about, I guess, the professionalism of the board and the reasoning of the board and everything else. And so, this all gets into a lot of issues that we discussed about um, maybe like having the board codify a set of expectations for membership. And that would include things like um, being at meetings unless you don't have, uh, or attending meetings unless you have good cause not to attend meetings, like having some sort of a policy surrounding that or a way that the board can address that. Um, keeping like your video cameras on. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other sort of member expectation items that I think would be really important for actual hearings. Um, and so I don't know if any of the uh, board members have any thoughts on any of that. I know several of you have sort of expressed a desire to have something like that, but um, yeah. If there's any anybody with thoughts on that, that would be great. So well, we didn't go into attendance, and I don't know if we did specifically talk about keeping cameras on. We did talk about meeting ground rules, and in fact, I was I was looking carefully at meeting ground rules when our public commenters were commenting to make sure the ground we have the same ground rules. I presume for 
of the commenters, right? Yeah, Kristen's rules that she reads before before the session, but um, I I think this wasn't really specific towards public comments or like timing professionalism with public comments as much as it is just kind of the board creating its own set of expectations for how things would operate um, to the extent those aren't captured in the procedural rules, so. Well, in the past, we have, the reason why it came up in our retreat is, you know, we at times needed to remind people to speak respectfully and not interrupt and um, not characterizing someone. I mean, I'm just reading from the ground rules, actually. Uh, avoid characterizing someone else's position as bad or wrong or, you know, naive or whatever. Uh, so those should, I assume, carry on unless we change them at some point in time. But they don't, we're not very specific about keeping cameras on and we're not very specific about attendance. But if I, correct me if I'm wrong, but there have been a couple board members removed from other boards uh, because of non-attendance, maybe. I don't know. You, you can tell me if I characterize that. Yeah, and that's, this isn't, I guess, directed at this, <laughs> the people in this room that that has happened with some of the other boards. Um, and I think the the overarching concern that I'm trying to address is just making sure that if people are coming potentially with attorneys who have prepped and they've incurred legal fees to sort of prepare for this, some of the people that come in um, might be nervous appearing before a board and potentially getting uh, you know, cross-examined and providing testimony. And it's just sort of a, a big deal for potentially for applicants. They might have a lot of money on the line. And so that was really what I was getting at was making sure we're going to for certain have a quorum and we're going to know, you know, who our chair is and if our chair isn't attending that the vice chair will be attending. And just having some of that worked out in anticipation of what I'm assuming will be uh, maybe not as intense as some of the past quasi-judicial hearings I've been involved with, but nonetheless, I mean, we need to treat them like it's a proper forum and there's an order and everybody um, is respectful of the participants and you as CLAB board members are serving in, in a quasi judicial role, right? So you're, you're not judges, uh, but you are effectively rendering decisions that impact people's legal rights, and which can have legal consequences for the city. And so um, that's kind of a, the big part of board attendance that was was percolating up. But um, yeah, so that that was kind of big picture thoughts. And I know I've had discussions just in my introductions to some folks about, about that potentially, but um, yeah, I'm not sure what direction you all wanna take it in or if we wanna have that discussion now or, or what, but. Does anyone want to have another retreat in the near future? When this retreat was from, it's almost, When was our last retreat? When did, November. In November, yeah. Yeah. If we were going to do an annual retreat, then it's only three months away. One, two, three, right? What does the staff feel about having another retreat? We're happy to facilitate a retreat whenever the board feels ready for that. Um, I do not think there are funds for another facilitator. So it would likely be a retreat that's run by staff and the board. So it's just something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Understand. Board, what do you think? Yeah. 
I mean, it would be, I'm assuming, in addition, unless we decide not to have a November meeting, it would be in addition to a November meeting. But it may not. How long did we go last time? Scheduled a half day for the last retreat. So that, I don't probably need, doesn't need to go quite as long. I would suggest maybe one or two hours. Anyone? Robin, Michael, Stacy, Allison? Allison, you got your hand up. Are you asking yeah, about I mean, it? Am I in favor of another in person retreat? Or also just the issue of how, like, do we need some more ground rules? I, I mean, my personal opinion is, as I don't think that we need more ground rules that are laid and, and respect with respect to any to the comments that you were making. I know this isn't personally coming from you against us personally, but right. um, just as an example, like my doorbell rang twice. I had to get up and answer the door. I felt like it would be weird if I didn't shut off my video and just got up and walked away. And then the public just sees a blank screen. Right. Um, I, I feel that it's more appropriate to shut our video off if we're not our faces physically there. Um, but you know, I'm I'm not wedded to that that policy. And I'm in favor of another in-person retreat. I think that that was helpful for, for us. Um, Allison, you had your hand up and then your hand went down and now Stacy's hand is up. Um, I'm, I agree with Michael. I think having an in-person retreat, um, it was really nice to do that last year. Um, I know last year we had some pretty specific things we wanted to talk about. Um, so I think if there were similar um, objectives or things that were really predefined that we wanted to talk about in a retreat, um, I'd be all for it. Um, and I do think it makes sense to revisit um, you know, some of the expectations. I think that's really helpful when um, setting things up for current board members and new board members to know what the expectation is and then also to have a conversation that's based more in you agreed to attend 80% of meetings, for example, versus I feel like you're not attending that many. Um, it can be nice to have those agreed upon expectations. So um, I would be in, in favor of that conversation if other folks are. Um, but not don't feel so strongly that it needs to happen if other folks don't feel it's necessary. And do you want to, while you're talking, do you want to weigh in on the, I think it's quite reasonable for Michael to, or any of us to turn our cameras off if we, like I, I turned mine off to go fill out my water bottle or whatever. That seems reason, quite reasonable. Stacy. Or Allison, do you want to comment on that? I was just saying, I mean, I think I, I think it's a fair, I think it's a fair expectation to add um, with a balance of a of a judgment call in, in a vehicle right now. So that feels like really unprofessional to have <laughs> show in my car. Um, but I, I think it's worthy of a conversation. And especially I think Andy makes some really good points about some additional scrutiny to the board and the decisions and um in this new phase of thinking about licensing, I, I think it's it's important to, to talk about and have some shared expectations. Okay, Stacy. I think the retreat was helpful last year. I mean, we found out a lot about each other that I think could come into play in understanding viewpoints when we're here meeting and it, you know, just learning a little more about each other's backgrounds where we don't have time to do that during meetings. Um, so that I think would be useful. I agree. It doesn't necessarily have to be a whole day thing. It could be even shorter than half day. Um, doesn't necessarily need a facilitator unless there are more, uh, what's the best way of putting it, like challenging topics to address. I think in that setting of facilitators are full, but if we're just talking about things that don't feel quite as triggering for people, I, I'm not feeling a strong need for that. Um, beyond that, you know, it's always helpful to review expectations and the way I see things that, you know, it's always good to hear it because it could be evolving and 
we should all know what the expectations are, especially as there's new members joining us. Um, and then the camera thing, yeah, I mean, if we are in a meeting in person and leave to go to the restroom, for example, that's akin to having your camera off, right? Like stepping out and chewing a granola bar real quick so everyone doesn't have to watch you chew. Like those are the types of moments where I think we need to be able to have adult discretion and professionally be able to turn off our cameras when we feel like that's appropriate or if you have a quick trip in your car or whatever it might be. But I, I think it can be part of the expectations that in general, we'll leave our cameras on, you know, barring those times where a, a member has to do whatever they have to do and the rest of the world doesn't need to bear witness to that, right? So just like you would in a regular meeting, it, you know, you can step out, we, you know, it doesn't need to be a big deal. If we did a retreat staff, um, assuming we could have it hybrid, because, you know, right, there's high likelihood Kate might not be able to make it, and maybe others. Yes, we could um, accommodate a hybrid retreat if that's what the board would like. Um, we could even look at turning the October meeting into a retreat, uh, since we were planning to do that hybrid anyways. But if you wanted to do something separate, we have the Brenton conference room available, which is set up for hybrid meetings, but we could definitely use that space. Okay. Well, so maybe we could actually keep the agenda purposefully light and have part of the meeting be a retreat. Is that a possibility? Are you suggesting that possibility? Yeah, I, th I think it's up to the board, but if you wanted to change October to a retreat instead of a meeting, I'm not sure about splitting it like half meeting, half retreat. I've never seen that done before. Not to say that it can't be done, but that's something I need to look into a little bit. Because mm -hmm. uh, retreats are not publicized or not um, televised or whatever. Not record or are they recorded? I don't know. We typically don't um, record the retreats. However, they are open to the public. They're publicly noticed. Um, and if it was hybrid, we would need to stream it for the public as well, I think. Right. Well, we did have people show up for the retreat, at least one. Uh, Robin and Ethan, do you want to weigh in? I, yeah, I mean, I, I liked the retreat as well. Uh, so I'm totally willing to do that. And in terms of the rules and stuff like that, the one thing that I think might be helpful to Andy's point is if you are going to miss, maybe we have a make a commitment to, unless it's an emergency, letting somebody know, you know, within a given amount of time, if it's possible. Um, that might be a helpful thing to expectation to actually write down and ask people to agree to. Yeah. Well, it's important also for quorum, right? Like if four people suddenly drop out at the last minute, then the rest of us have blocked off that time and we don't have quorum, then the time is wasted for everyone. So it seems like that's a real important thing to do, you know, to like let people know if you're not going to be there because we may have to cancel a meeting if a bunch of people aren't there for whatever reason. And so that would be better for all of us, I'm sure, to know in advance, not like at 3.15, you know, on the day of. And, and Brian has an emergency come up within the past 24 hours, which is, I mean, he was planning to be here, but um, something came up. And Michael's usually pretty good about letting people know and uh, Kate's usually pretty good about letting people know. I think Allison's been here pretty much every time. Ethan, you want to weigh in? Yeah, um, I mean, being a new newer member, um, haven't had the opportunity to take part in a retreat, so I'm, I'm certainly in, in support of it. Um, if it does land in October, uh, we just need to work things out or let let Alana know um, when the next available meeting would be for her to 
do her concentrate presentation. Well, maybe Kristen um, or whoever is the person that would try to determine, maybe we could just do a retreat for one hour and Alana could still go on in October. I don't know. I mean, I think with a, a retreat, it's important to think about what would be different than a regular meeting is would the goals of a retreat be met if we were all in person together and folks had a chance to chat a little bit more or are there some more substantive things that folks want to talk about in addition to that um i don't i don't know the answer but i don't know if it's if it if it takes a lot of effort if it takes more from staff to put together a retreat or a retreat like option um then i'd want to make sure that we had a really clear vision for what the goals of that were Go ahead, Ethan. Maybe pushing the retreat closer to um, the end of the year as we near, um, you know, the inten intention to adopt and move forward with our, our licensing duties um, would be more appropriate if there are things related to that that we need to, to iron out. So maybe November, December would be more appropriate. Okay. I personally don't want a, the retreat to become a, like a crazy animal in and of itself because I, I think the main things is for us to see each other in person if that's possible. Um, and then maybe just go over ground rules and, you know, we, we've done it before, so we can look, we can bounce off of past like procedures or emotions and it's how to make meetings run well. It's kind of what we did at the first retreat, Ethan. We already have the kind of the groundwork. I don't want to, I don't, I'm hoping not to have a four hour retreat, by the way. Okay, 6.41, um, I always like to let people off early, but I wanna see if anyone has other things. There were some articles, but I think, Robin, did you submit any? I think Brian was, uh, so they're interesting articles towards the end of the packet. I submitted an article about the da the Danish study and the link between um, psychosis slash schizophrenia that that study concluded was evident. So I think it's worthy of taking a look. It's such a devastating condition. Okay. Anybody else? I'll probably be sending through that. Um, the epigenetic one that I mentioned, and then also, I don't think we've seen the the thing that came out two days ago, or maybe you all have seen it, I don't know, it's in the daily camera, or four different, what are they called? The edit, it's not the editorial board, that's probably giving them too much. Um, it's just the camera has this tradition of keeping a volunteer board of, of writers and they will take up a different topic and they've been doing this for like, I don't know, I want to say about 15 years or so. Um, and it's always really interesting. You, you always get lots of different flavors and I, I thought the column was pretty good one. It's worthy. It's worth a read and if maybe we can include it in the next packet. Yeah. I'm not sure they followed our ground rules, but anyways. As long as they can follow the daily cameras ground rules. Okay. Um, if no one else has anything else, anyone want to make a motion to adjourn? I motion to adjourn. Second on that? I second. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right. You, you get 17 minutes <laughs> of additional time. All right. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, staff. Thank you. Thank you, staff. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.